Hello and welcome to Harry Potter and the Rewind Reviews. This week we're doing, uh, what is it, this is Harry Potter, the, the Fantastic Crimes of Grindledore. It's this, this, this one, it's this, 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 this thing, where, where we've got charmingly befuddled but lacking any sort of character, Newt Scamander is our new lead. Watch him bumble his way through many, many circumstances for entertainment, apparently, so I'm told. How are we doing, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> Many, many. Well, because that well, you you've hit upon there a big feeling of mine about this movie. But we'll, uh, I suppose we, I suppose a little a little reset. I guess. Did you see? Did you see this in the cinema? We did you. What's your? Yes. Well, yeah. I suppose we should clarify what we do. We do. It's a pod, podcast where we talk about all nostalgic movies. Generally speaking, we do movies from our childhood. But we're doing the Harry Potter franchise, which starts in movies from our childhood. And if we do the whole franchise, we end up here um which is if anyone's wondering why in the world we're reviewing a movie this recent this might be the most recent movie we've done if it isn't we're about to hit that in a couple episodes because we are going to be doing grindelwald and secrets of dumbledore as well um but yes uh, a little reset we usually do a little bit of like what's our history with the franchise now if you want to hear our history with harry potter franchise in general we'll go back to the first episode of this bonus episode run we're doing currently but specifically to this movie i'll be honest with you chris i was so excited for this movie I so excited. I like written by JK. Yes, directed by Yates, but Cloves was just a producer. Fine. Love it. Like like, you know, different, you know, actually written by the author, not based on a book, so it wasn't all going to be crammed in. I thought what exciting casting to get Eddie Redmayne into the into the franchise. I liked the look of it from the trailers. I thought it looked funny. Uh, and light and fun and I remember thinking god this could be really good as long as JK makes the simple decision to you know not cram a novel's worth of story into a movie I think we're okay and maybe a little less like deliberate mysteries that don't really add anything to it let's just just tell a nice fun adventure about a man coming to New York and uh, some animals escape and he's got he's got to catch them again with the help from his from from his little team of friends, while also being in trouble with the, the the American Ministry for doing such a thing, that sounds like a really fun movie to me. Let's do that. Was what I said. So I went into the cinema to see this movie, pretty excited. Mm. I was not thrilled with the result. <laughs> I still think it's maybe well from memory, it's the best of these three. Uh, but that's not saying a whole lot because I actually think while a lot of people go, eh, the first one was fine. Yeah, the first one sows the seeds for all the problems with the sequels. So, for, in my opinion, everything you don't like about the subsequent films is started here. Um, uh, is most likely what I would say to someone who says that to me. So, you know, um, we'll see. Time will tell. I mean, I, 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 one of these is very fresh in my memory. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I can tell you right now, it does not function as a film of any kind. We'll get to that. But um, in, in terms of just this one, I was excited for it and i was disappointed by it because i I really thought putting it in the hands of the author of the books was a smart idea um and it was not (laughs) it was it was not yeah i i didn't really i almost sort of didn't have an opinion on it like i just i didn't even i didn't see it in the cinema i saw it in dvd uh and actually got a bit sleepy um that that really i i understand after the first one you know I, i i understand after this one why you wouldn't go back rush to the cinema to see one of these but the first one, were you, did you really not see this in the cinema? So you've not seen any of these three in the, we're about to review in the cinema? No, and this is the only one I'd seen prior to doing this. Um, so the wait, next so you, two so, I haven't so wait, seen so you've still not seen uh, Crimes of um, Wizard Hitler? No, because we discussed how I hadn't seen it when we started doing this. So, I thought so we why would I then? how you didn't bother with Secrets of Dumbledore. I didn't realise you hadn't seen the next one either. <laughs> No, because I think the way I phrased it was, and much to Dan's surprise, I think oh, it's wow, two, not that. three. Um, but yeah, no, I just, I don't know why, because especially like, I do remember this time and watching it the first time, you know, when the music starts and you get that kind of nostalgic Harry Potter vibes. Um, and I was, I remember being like, oh, maybe I should have, you know, checked this out sooner um, when I watched it for the first time. I, I don't know. I can't tell you why i didn't i don't know whether there was just no interest around me and i was like yeah whatever um yeah i don't know just wasn't that when did it come out 2016 yeah i couldn't i couldn't honestly i couldn't tell you why i definitely don't think i'd hit that sort of 
fatigue yeah, that we the discussed sort of Harry in the first Potter episode apathy. with her. Yeah, yeah. I don't, th- I don't think I'd reached that yet. Um, I think just uh, I hadn't, you know, got round to seeing it. Basically, um, you know, sometimes that happens. I, I love Thor. I haven't got round to seeing the fourth Thor. You know what I mean? Sometimes there's just circumstances dictate that you, you don't you go mean to the cinema f- or four. Huh? <laughs> you what? Sorry, uh, I just made a bad joke about how Thor sounds like the number four. Uh, Nice, very nice. <laughs> virtual, virtual high five. Um, so, look, to... look. If, you, if people come here for high quality podcasting, and we deliver, that's all I want to say. <laughs> um, we cannot but, be yeah, accused let's, of let's... not making very clever jokes on this point. I mean, that was come on, that's top tier. That is, no one's ever thought of that joke before. Yeah, yeah. If you if you want fantastic jokes, this is where to find them. Hey, <laughs> oh. Uh, now did, yeah. um, Chris is going to go off and watch the four. <laughs> <laughs> I might watch it tomorrow, actually. Yeah, because um, it's just it's for those of you who don't know, because we'll record these in advance. Uh, it's it's just hit Disney Plus, um, like yeah. today in the UK. Oh, Chris, but you sure you're not going to watch Pinocchio first? You're not really excited to see Tom Hanks play Geppetto? <laughs> no, because sometimes you know when you you know when you like don't aren't particularly going to see a film, but then you <laughs> you then see on YouTube like your feed is full of you know, the the movie reviewers you follow and just often their thumbnails just all seem to have the same expression. Everyone's thumbnails are the same for Pinocchio, baby. <laughs> like, just a series of... Uh, I'm kind of um, looking forward to it. I keep seeing people post clips and be like, you know, what is this? This is insane. And then I click on the clip and I'm just like, this seems fucking brilliant. Like, and I don't mean that in like, that this will be a masterpiece for movie. Right? I'm just like, this seems so willfully stupid. I kind of want to see it because I'm I'm not convinced from these clips that the people making this movie weren't aware what they were doing. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. And if there's intent yeah, yeah. to some of the movie being dumb, I'm okay with that. It, it just depends on whether I think, you know, we'll see. We'll yeah. see. But, um... Very, very. Yeah. Um, I, I, I probably will catch that at some point. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not rushing to watch Pinocchio, though. I will, I will see it in due course. I'm sure. Uh, anyway, back to f- it, fantastic yeah, crimes of, of, of Grindledore. So let's let's uh, see. When you made that joke at first, when you introduced it with that joke, I was like, "Shit, has Dan watched the second one <laughs> first? <laughs> um, I'm glad to see you haven't. Um, let's talk about. Let's talk about kind of at the heart of the the, the two kind of, um, you know, what you've indicated there, which is basically movies trying to do too many things, isn't it? Like the movie of new bumming around New York, like escaped animals. I think there would need to be in order to make that movie. I'd like a bit more coherency as opposed to literally a series of this animal has escaped. What are we going to do? Like some sort of <laughs> plot or something that intertwines them. You know, it begins to feel a bit like, okay, we're chucking sequences of Fantastic Beasts into this movie so we can justify the name. Um, so even that version of the movie, I think, would need to, you know, you couldn't just take out the this, this other stuff. Well, yeah, um, but you'd it, need to still do a bit su- of work. There's th- but... such a simple fix. It's such a simple fix. You take out Grindelwald. <laughs> That's mm. that's what needs to go. That's the that's the fix. You take out Grindelwald and you make um, Credence um, involved in the plot in a different way. You don't you you get rid of this whole. It's, it's you know revealing us to the you know intentionally it's a plan of Grindelwald's to intentionally reveal us to the Wizarding World because for those who don't remember should clarify plot of the movie um because this one isn't as like as famous as like a Harry Potter movie in terms of plot so I should I should clarify very quickly Newt arrives in New York he's looking to free a Thunderbird that um he found uh, that had been trafficked he's returning it to its home in Arizona. But when he gets there, he gets immediately wrapped up in a situation where, um, well, first of all, some animals of his animals escape, and he's off trying to solve that problem. But subsequent to that, uh, Grindelwald is has infiltrated the ministry. Um, well, you don't know that at first. Uh, that the American ministry, the U.S. Wizarding Congress, whatever they call it, um, and basically he is looking for this thing called an, obs- an obscurus, 
which is uh, a very dangerous magical entity that latches onto a to a small child, makes their magic sort of drives them insane from the out inside and inside out, and that hurts everyone. He wants to use that to reveal the wizarding world. The Ministry don't want that, and they think they get mixed up and think Newt's brought the obscurest thing into the country uh, instead of one of his more harmless, in his words, animals. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's all a big series of misunderstandings. But as you might already be able to tell from me trying to describe this plot to you, there's no thrust to this movie. So you take Grindelwald out. What you've actually got is a movie where Newt comes to New York, maybe even to look into these stories of the Obscurus, not to return the Thunderbird. And gets wrapped up because the, then the American government think he might be he might have brought it, and it's just that's your big threat for the movie is this thing is out there hurting people, and what you do is instead of having credence be part of this weird anti magic religion thing, credence is like the kid of one of the main characters, like maybe Tina already has like a teenage kid or something, or a, you know a young young child or whatever. Um, you know, and you lay in a few false trails so you can maybe disguise who it's gonna, or you know, have a few different candidates for who the who it might be that's the Obscurus. But then the movie plays out with Newt trying to clear his name and catch the Obscurus to protect everyone. That's your movie, because then you can have him run around chasing a couple of random beasts as well, because they escape his case because he's inept. That's fine. I don't, I don't love that stuff, but I don't hate that stuff either. Like you know, but like it's it's you know it's. It, it, the only problem with that stuff is that it makes Newt look inept constantly. That's the big issue. It's like, this is the hero of the franchise, and he's literally bad at his job. He's bad at the one thing he's supposed to be good at <laughs> constantly in the movie. But anyway, the, to me, this whole thing about the plot being there being too much there is so simply solved. That's what's frustrating. It's like they couldn't decide which movie they wanted to make. Do they make the dark, early years of the Wizarding War Grindelwald trilogy... Or do they make the Newt Scamander goes off with his muggle friend and does does adventures with animals, you know, magical beasts, and they try to smoosh them together instead of just doing one or the other, and that is the problem at the heart of these movies. The tone is balanced okay in this one, but it's a fucking shit show from here on out. <laughs> An absolute shit show. That decision fucked this entire franchise from minute one. Yeah, but, but it, like say, even in this movie, you can hear, you can feel the two things mm-hmm. fighting against each other. Mm-hmm. There's a sequence. I can't remember what it is, but there's a sequence where we don't even like cut to Grindelwald for ages. Like it's, I think it's probably them going into the suitcase or maybe the Central Park stuff. Um, and you're just like, oh yeah, there's like a whole other subplot that I don't particularly care about happening. Oh yeah, who who who, who knew? Um, yeah, every time it cuts to like. That fucking senator and his dad who runs a newspaper and that other guy that's the brother that's shit on. Like, I'm just like, why are any of you in this fucking movie? Who are yeah. you to this? What's your purpose here? Because as far as I can see, it's none. <laughs> well, it's 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 franchise building, isn't it? And, you you know, you don't know. I think that sort of jk and warner brothers you know both it's both to their both you know the way jk rowling thinks creatively and obviously the way warner brothers think financially is to is to build this into a big franchise thing but, but what, what does what does the newspaper guy have to that what, what does the newspaper guy whose son is a senator and his other son's a waster what's what's he got to do with no, anything I've got no idea this is yeah, my point. No, this no is idea. this this is that whole thing as well of like one of the problems here is hiring a the novelist to write a movie and i and i and i mean that in the you know i don't i don't mean to sound mean spirited about this but unfortunately if you do do that you've got to be wary of a few different pitfalls one of them is too many characters because in a novel a character shows up for a couple of scenes doesn't really have a lot to do with the art overall you you novel is so large that's fine and maybe even expected you know even shorter novels have characters that come and go in a movie you just have to be more streamlined if they have a purpose in your plot give it to someone else don't have someone show up for one thing. Have all the characters serve multiple points in your story instead of having a million characters. Because why are we pulling focus from Newt and Queenie and uh, the other the other rest of the gang? You know, Tina and... I, I always forget. Jacob, Jacob. Mr. Kowalski. Jacob. Yeah, yeah. You know, why are we pulling who's... focus from that group ever? Yeah. Who's arguably, let's be honest, one of the best things about the movie. 
Oh, um, oh I mean, I, honestly, I, 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 my, my favorite thing to come out of the Fantastic Beasts franchise is Jacob, Jacob Kowalski as a character. Everything about him, yeah. from the, the, the wonderful performance um, from, I always forget the guy's name, Dan, Dan Fogler, um, who's just brilliant in this role. Um, everything he, that character says and does and touches is just fucking magic. I love it so much. He's great. He's the, the without a doubt the most watchable thing about this entire franchise, for sure. But the, it, in general, the chemistry like between the two, between the various pairs in that four, is is great. Like I, you, sure. you find yourself wanting when we're not with those four, you find yourself wanting to go back to those four. Probably, yes. to be honest with you, more than you find yourself hoping to see some beast shit. Um, yep. Because, you know, the beast stuff is fun. Um, but do you agree with my assertion that there's just a few too many sequences of the gang trying to catch a beast? Um, see, I'm torn on that because I feel like... Because they're all... I think the problem... You've identified the problem, but I think you've... like. I don't think the issue is that there are too many of those sequences, basically. I do think the sequences are a problem, but the problem is they're all crammed into the first act and a half of the movie. Because the last act of the movie has to be all the Grindelwald obscure stuff, right? That's what you like that's what the last act of your movie has to become round to because of this weird decision they've made to make this the start of an early wizarding war plus Newt's commander and his friends fuck about. So what you've what they you know I, it, it's like they had two movies and they really just pushed them together and the first movie takes up the first act and therefore it's like immediately sequence after sequence after sequence of going around catching an animal. If the movie just was that and didn't have to do all the Grindelwald stuff, then they'd be more spread out. They would, you know, there's a movie's worth of them in this. But you'd spread them out better and it wouldn't feel quite so... So I, I think you're right. It is a problem. And I think in this version of the movie, if you're determined to do that Grindelwald stuff, you cut one or two um, just to pace it better. But actually, I think it comes back to that original issue I had, which is just that choice in general to put the the the, the, the wizarding early Wizarding War stuff in, in there with Grindelwald. Because that's just pointless. Because you, as soon as you do that, you're forced to cram all the um, Fantastic Beast stuff into the first half of the movie. And let me tell you, Chris, a little, a little tease now. You... Like, the, the, the tentative connection to the subtitle of Fantastic Beasts gets worse as these movies go on. <laughs> is that our new? Is there enough wizard school in my wizarded school movie? Is it? Is there yeah. enough beasts in our in yeah. my Fantastic and, Beasts movie? And the answer is always yes, but like it always it becomes why though? Like in the later movies, like <laughs> why are we doing yeah. this? Like the ways in which they have to yeah. force this to be about beasts in the later movies gets sillier and sillier. Yeah, because I, in... I cannot wait for you to watch Secrets of Dumbledore. I'm so excited. <laughs> in this one, that's that's done relatively well. Like fundamentally, it's a beast that saves the day. He, right. you know, he he captures Grindelwald with a beast doing something that we've had set up earlier mm-hmm. in the in the movie. So, you know that that works. I think they, you know, it it. It uh, it intertwines them in that moment, and it you know it all. It, the trouble with this movie is, it all functions. Does it? It's just <laughs> all, all well. Yeah, on paper, I think it does all function. It's just not always that entertaining. Sometimes it's just a bit. All right. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. I think I don't think it. Well, okay. Depends on what you mean by function, I suppose. Does the story mostly track A to B? Yeah, I guess it does. It's, I think yeah, that's it's what... Un- Dan, I, Dan, yeah. Dan. We're reviewing the Wizarding World movies. Have we not made it clear over the le- next eight, the last eight episodes that the story functioning from A to B is a win? <laughs> 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 You're right. You're right. You're right. Um, okay, so yeah, if, we're, if that's the bar, yeah, sure. Okay. The story mostly functions. It's not a complete house of cards that topples the minute you pluck one out. I don't think. I think it's mostly there, right? But, and this is a fucking big but, there is absolutely no thought put into many of the elements. And while a lot of it can be fansplained, several of the the decisions and choices of the characters make almost no sense. Um, There are also a lot of weird, like, how does that work? Moments in this movie where, again, without context, it, and it, this really does in places feel like it's based on a book that we haven't read. That's what's funny about it. Like, so a Thunderbird can 
create and live in like storms and stuff. Cool. All right. So it creates the magic rain that makes everyone forget because he's, we already set up earlier in the movie. Oh, uh, the swooping evil has a venom that if diluted can remove bad memories. Right. And so he's, you know, you put that in with the oh, rain yeah. the Thunderbird creates. We have magic. Yeah, you're right. I'd, I'd forgotten about this bit. Yeah, you're right. In terms of functioning, maybe it may be the, you know, maybe the the resolution doesn't function, Dan. But yeah, <laughs> yeah because sorry, well, this on. is the, <laughs> yeah, which is I think quite an important moment because basically the premise for those who don't remember is magic memory rain because Dan the- getting pernickety again. God, always wants always wants the resolutions to be clear cut. <laughs> I, I always want my resolution to make sense. You're right. I'm a monster. But basically, because yeah. the problem that the movie has at the end is when they defeat the bad guy and stop his evil plan, which is vague and unclear, because everything in this movie is vague and unclear in terms of character motivations. Um, when they stop uh, Grindelwald, it's not Grindelwald, but Grindelwald, they then have this issue, which is that a bunch of shits happened in the middle of New York that thousands if not millions of <laughs> muggles have seen, right? Um, you know, we've had people taking pictures. They ast- oh, they literally that blew my mind. They literally have a shot of the guy being like, everyone get pictures of this. Does the rain erase the pictures? Yeah, it's. It, I mean, it doesn't make any sense, mate. Like, well, it, that's the other thing. Not everyone is stood out in the rain, as we established, because Mr. Kowalski is underneath it and has his memories until he goes out into it. And then they well, try to cover that, that with we... these really lazy shots of, <laughs> of of people drinking water, like their their drinking water has already got this rain in it, and people showering because everyone drinking water and showering at that moment also covered. Yeah, that's what got me. I was like, you're literally showing shots of people inside and presumably he's not covered because he's inside. And then weird things like throughout the montage, we have witches and wizards just out in the rain and that's fine, like, you know, zapping stuff back. But Queenie has to have an umbrella. Like, is that just, you know, a queeny thing? or Yeah, does she just not... Is she, just, she, just, does she, is she avoiding the memory rain? Or does she just not want to get wet? Unclear, Chris. Because mm. the wizards are all outside. Uh, if the explanation is, oh, they're all in, like, big coats and hats and stuff, is not everyone in big coats and hats in this time? I don't understand. I, I Like, it doesn't, it doesn't track for a minute. Like, none of it. And here's the thing. What's crazy about it is it's so easily fixed. I, I cannot express to you, Chris, how easy it is to fix this. The Thunderbird creates a storm cloud, and when the rain hits the ground, it mists, and it becomes a fog. Mm. Problem solved, because then everyone indoors, you know, you can show shots of fog creeping under doors and going through cracks in windows, and you go, all right, fine, everyone got it. And you go, it doesn't work on wizards. Yeah, because do they ever actually state it doesn't work on wizards? No. That was like, I was like, well, it must just not... The explanation can't be, surely they're all in big hats. <laughs> sure, I no, just, exactly. You, I just it, there isn't one. So you've got to try and fans... This is what I said earlier about fans. Yeah, you've got yeah. to try and make it make sense. Because the, the line in the movie is literally... Where is it? It is... I wrote it down. Uh, God, there's so many, so many bunch of bad dialogue in this movie. Um, where is it? Here it is. Um, yeah, it's venom that if diluted can remove bad memories. Now he doesn't clarify if it doesn't work on wizards there. And also, as we'll discover in the next movie, taking away Jacob's memories is a problem <laughs> because you want to. Apparently, you want to keep that character around. So here's the other thing, Chris. Let me pitch this to you: satisfying movie ending for Jacob, right? The wizards. Are all around the, the the ministry. They're like, nope, you got to send him out into the rain. They say their goodbyes. Jacob goes out into the rain. He looks a bit lost. Then he wanders off. And then later on, Queenie goes to see him, and he does indeed remember. And she's like, how? How do you remember? And he says, well, it erases bad memories. And I made friends. Ugh, that's good. Right. That's very good. Right. Because yeah. then, you he's got his memories. Because- the, 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 the ministry Which, think he doesn't. He's got his friends. We've given him a nice character closure. And we've... we I, He didn't have... He, he, it was bad for everyone else. But he, he had a good is, time. 
Which is the other logic thing that we need to discuss here. Are these people forgetting that their, you know, pets that have died are dead? Are people going to be like, where's where's Howard the dog? Yes. Like, because... <laughs> I what, this down too. <laughs> what, what do you mean by bad memories? Like, what's yeah. the, what are we defining here? Yeah, I wrote, how does the memory juice target stuff specifically? Does anyone just forget, like, more or less? Like... <laughs> you know, did they did they forget they've left the oven on? Did they forget their entire job? Did they forget where they put their glasses? Maybe their kids? <laughs> I wrote yeah. that down in my notes. <laughs> That's so, so weird. Confused. I just there's well, so most, many things. I mean, most, just, like, to be they, fair, they, most so much most, of this feels like it needs a second draft, what, right? <laughs> what I love, what I love about that is like you've just you've just made yourself you know the 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 heartwarming idea you presented of uh, Jacob doesn't forget because they're good memories mm-hmm. um you know and you're like oh Dan Dan's sort of a really heartwarming lovely idea then um slightly undermined 2 minutes later by you going i mean do they forget other you know they presumably forget other bad memories like their kids <laughs> like i think most people would <laughs> would probably say their kids weren't bad memories, Dan. But uh... <laughs> you tell me right now, there's a parent on the face of the earth that doesn't have a bad memory with their children. Their kid fell yes, off and it, broke their arm and gave them a real fright. Uh, they, just they, not... Having to stay up late nights and like, you know, I, I, you're lying if, you, if, you, if you're out there and you don't, you don't think parents are having some, some bad times with their children as much as they love yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you just you just used the word kids. You didn't, you didn't specify. No, I'm saying like, are they, what memories. are they not oh, forgetting? Like, it could be something as frivolous yeah. as where they put their glasses. It could be something as large yeah. as their entire like. Just be they don't remember. Like, look, my point was, we don't know the limit of this thing. It could be as extreme yeah, as yeah, one yeah. thing or as thin as the other. Yeah, it's maddening, man. It's really crazy. It's, uh... So, I, I, you know, you know, does the movie track? I guess in terms of like. When it, the, at the beginning, because she's trying to make everything a mystery, the beginning of the movie, you feel like nothing really is following or making sense. But ultimately, and it also, all kind of so, comes together. But yeah, sorry to really. sorry to interrupt as well. But you you fundamentally, the solution is because obviously you know, J.K. Rowling's got the power here. The solution is fundamentally a bird amplifying something. So can't the bird just amplify any spell, or they put? They put the obliv. They put. They turn. He's got an obliviate potion. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, and it and it's it's about rather than just this generic bad memories. It's specifically, you know what I mean. If they mutter obliviate into the bird, the bird then can turn that into can that send that into the rain or. Uh, Newt's really good at potions, and he's got an Obliviate post- potion that he can add a spell to, and then that does it with all of them. Like, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's really strange because I because also like the the bad memory thing is one throwaway line about thirty forty minutes into the movie that's then not referenced again when they actually do the ending. So, mm. strictly speaking, if you want to ignore that throwaway line, you could go well, it's just erasing memories of the last 20 minutes or whatever but like still um, (laughs) yeah I don't know you're right there's basically you have you're right what you're essentially saying and I think that you'll you'll agree with this is basically why choose such an unnecessarily complicated solution to the problem Mm. you could you could come up with something way simpler that you could establish earlier in the movie that would be the solution to this and I, I understand the notion, because what the notion is, is Newt saves the day with beasts. That's the, that's the thinking, right? It has to be a beast-related thing. That's fine. Have a beast that erases, erases memories. I, I don't care. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be one of the beasts that's the house mascot for one of the American wizarding school's houses. Because the Thunderbird is is one of the houses for, the, for was it Ilvermory or whatever it's called, the American... Wizarding School, their version of Hogwarts. The Thunderbird is like, you know, one of their houses, like their Gryffindor or whatever. And part of me just goes like, was this just like an ad for Pottermore? Like, did you just, yeah. did you want me to go Googling that and find that out? Like, <laughs> why? Why did it have to be that animal? I, you got plenty of other deep cut references into the movie. We had bow truckles. We had a fucking demi guys. You know, we got an erumpent, Chris. An erumpent 
from Deathly Hallows, the horn that blows up Xenophilius Lovegood's house. That's insane. That's a really weird deep cut. Uh, cool. I don't also need it to be a Thunderbird. It c- so if you want to solve the problem with a beast, like, and make it a Newt saves the day situation, which I'm fine with, he is supposed to be the fucking hero of these movies, the lead. He doesn't feel it in the next two, but, like, it, at least in this one, he kind of does. Um, yeah, like, let, you know, let Newt solve the know, problem, but make up anything else. <laughs> you know what it could be? It could be... Um, Jacob goes to look at look at something, and Newt goes, oh, "Oh, if you look at that, you'll be you'll be transfixed. This this bird, this beast, um, completely transfixes Muggles." And then in the end, you have him release that beast. It goes in the air. All the Muggles are completely transfixed and staring at it. And the wizards go out and shoot their wands up to the sky to the sky and do like a all casting shield obliviate spell and oh, refix yeah, right. everything. And, yeah, you know. or you could, or, or like it freezes time or something in anything like that, yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Great, same same solution. And then you know each wizard is casting and obliviate really carefully, and that's the other thing, right? The movie wants us to be tense about the situation. The stakes are they're trying to protect the wizarding world from being uncovered by muggles, right? That's the that's the plot of the movie. Yes. Why would yeah. you make that the plot of a movie? When we've already seen the future, no, it doesn't happen. What's that thinking? Just from a yeah, but stakes this, perspective, I, I, when you see all those Americans, they're all like, oh, take pictures, it's crazy. Are you going, oh no, the muggles know. <laughs> yeah, but that's, but mate, that's another flaw with this whole, with the whole Fantastic Beast series. Is it Grindelwald's the ultimate? E- well, not really. <laughs> like, Voldemort is going to overtake him, and we know that ultimately Grindelwald doesn't succeed. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I'm like, like that's okay, you want to tell inherent. that story, fine, but you've got to find some stakes we're going to care about, because, yeah, I don't I don't care about any of this. And, I mean, yeah, and that... And they... Go on, sorry. I just don't think they do. It's just all the stakes are just a little... Like you say, it's a novel approach. Like, we... I guess it's kind of interesting yeah. that one of our central love stories, there's the inclination that he's got a history with a Lestrain and even she says that at the end and you know but again why is that that backstory doesn't add anything to this film Mm -hmm. it feels like it it just feels unnecessary and this film's got a lot of that and I think it's a shame because if you just strip some of that out and really concentrate on that core four they're interesting enough characters with good enough actors for that to sustain a movie yeah And and there's some good stuff for them in the second one too I would say I think like they they make some interesting choices, particularly they don't not fall through on, but there's some really interesting choices for Queenie. I think in the next movie that I was like really excited to see play out. But we'll we'll come to that. But I think yeah, you're right. Those four core characters, if focused on properly, could have been really good. And then forming a little gang that's like Newt's little team that he goes around the world with, and like you know gets into magical beast related scrapes is like yeah, please, I I, I want that. Mm. Um, and I, we never got it, and that's a, and that's a real shame. Um. Let's talk about Newt, though, we're, while we're on the subject. So I, I've, I've posited already, so I will ask you the question, Chris, but I've posited already. I don't think I don't think Newt goes on any kind of meaningful anything in this movie. I don't think he has much of a character, and I don't think he changes. To the point where one of the last things he says in the movie, which is like, it's like the movie literally saying, like, I don't know, whatever, uh, where, he, where he literally says, I've changed, I think, maybe a little. That's an actual quote that he says at the end of the movie when he's talking to Tina. It's insane. So my question to you, Chris, is how did you feel about the new character? Is he is he anything? Does anything change? What, I don't, what did you feel? No, literally, as he was walking away, uh, I literally last night thought the sentence, not really gone on a journey, has he? Mm. <laughs> like, and, and, you know, arguably Jacob hasn't either because he's back to square one, but he it feels like Jacob in a way has more of an arc. Um, and you know what? Thinking about it, and I've only just thought of this, but it, something you've just said about or, and me bringing up the, the strange thing, you know what's really annoying? I think, again, I think it's there for the taking. Whatever she did really hurt him, and he no longer gives a fuck about any human. He comes to America not in any way bothered 
about any human. Whenever he interacts with someone at the bank, outside the bank, in the in the queue getting into the country, he's short, he's a bit short, he's a bit snippy. He doesn't really want to get involved with Jacob, not because he's muggle, but because he's like human. And then over the course of this movie, he learns to form a bond with humans again. Right, culminating in which the one moment that I noted was a moment of sort of character for him, which is his choice to talk to Credence instead of mm. fight him at yeah. the end. Yeah, yeah. Because then yeah. you've literally shown growth across a movie. Yeah. Which I don't yeah, think is literally... a lot to fucking ask for, <laughs> to be honest. No, it's no, not when he not when he's literally painted as our lead. I I thought you were going to say about whether um you know he's a bit bumbly in his competence and the one, oh that oh, the oh, scene... we're coming back to that <laughs> but I, I fucking trust me we're no, coming back I, to that i i don't think anyone and how by the way is credence back in the next movie i've seen the trailers i know he's in it what the fuck um i don't think anyone yeah. goes on a journey in this movie apart from arguably jacob but even jacob really his journey is he has a great time and he finds some friends but then they get taken away from him. So, you yeah, know, maybe which you, which you could argue actually... is like a story of a tragedy, right? Like that's like, oh, it's tragic. That's what happens. Yeah. But... T- Tina, actually, Tina gets her. In fact, I take the Jacob thing back. Tina is the one that actually has an arc. She is starts not having got her job, um, desperate to try and prove herself and, and prove something. By the end, she's been proven right and she gets her job back. Tina goes through an arc. Hmm. It is Tina, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it is Tina. I'm just like, I'm going like, oh, is that? Like. Yeah, I think Newt just, and uh, Newt changes her more than she changes him. Yeah. She's more open. She's more fun. Yeah, she kind of, yeah, she kind of learns to be, it's not, it's not really clear, but you're right. In her behaviors, you can see growth in her, I'd say. Yeah, fine. Uh, it's it's thin, but it is it is present. I would say it's fine for a character of her involvement, if that makes sense. Like a character that's only in the movie for as much as she's in the movie, that's like a reasonable, fu- reasonably functional arc, I would guess. But like mm. Newt, who's in all of the movie, should definitely have more of an arc. Um, yes, undoubtedly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not to go back to a previous point, but I just wanna I wanna also ask one other quick question about the memory thing that's just occurred to me that I hadn't thought of before. You know that guy that's son got murdered by the Obscurus? Mm, yeah, Does he just go, completely. where's my son gone? Yeah. So weird. I That, more than anyone, does that, more than anything, does that whole thing come back? Because, you know, more than the Grindelwald stuff, the, him and his son and his other son, are they in future movies? I don't think so. Because that felt more that felt that the when when we cut to the like the the fancy event they're at, I literally out loud was like, "What are we doing here? <laughs> what? Right. Like this this come out of nowhere, isn't it? Suddenly, so yeah. More than anything, I think they're the plot that's like, and I get it, like because the argument is." Well, that death is what makes them think it's, you know, they think it's one of Noop's monsters and they, it's, it's killed a muggle and it's caused all these problems. So, and I guess maybe you need to establish who that muggle is and that's the argument. But I don't know for sure that you need to establish, do you? Yeah, well, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying, they're definitely not in secrets because I saw that recently. I don't believe from memory that they're in crimes but i don't think i've seen crime since i saw it in the cinema so don't right. quote me on that no no i i no, i don't think they are in it. i can't see any way they'd be in it the movie's not even in new york it's in it's in france so i that i just no i don't think yeah because isn't isn't the idea each fantastic beast is going to be in a different location right 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 yeah so we get to learn about the, so, the wizarding culture in different countries let me tell you the one that's set in france not a lot of french people just gonna put that out there now and isn't isn't the third one set in britain <laughs> Maybe I'd, <laughs> yeah, I guess. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. It's a bad series of movies. Um, let's 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 so let's talk about uh, let's talk about um, Newt's capabilities do, because 
Go on, sorry. Do you think though? Do you think though, if it was, if you take out Grindelwald and truly make it a one-off, and you don't have them obliviate, you know, they the the thing is, it's Muggles v wi- wi- Wizards and Witches. But by the end, there's the one small step of leaving Jacob's memory, and Newt walks away to from a New York that might have a better future. And Newt and Tina agree to meet up. Um, you know, we get the feeling they definitely will. Do you think then it's like, what a lovely little caveat to the Harry Potter story? And do you think then it's, you know, this movie is looked upon very differently? Yeah, I do think it changes things. I do think it changes things quite a bit. Essentially, the movie becomes what the what the book was. You know, that this this book was released alongside Quidditch Through the Ages, two little things released together for i think it was comic mm. relief or something a I little just, a little bonus a little uh, a little bonus story from the world well it's not though the the the, the, the fantastic beasts book is a is just a list of beasts is it i can't remember what was in it yeah no it wasn't it wasn't this story it wasn't anything to do with this stuff it was it was literally no just, no no it, but i no but it, that's it, what i mean though just a little what i mean is that sense of Oh, you can also have this, that fun little... It's a, it's not an epilogue, but it's a fun little bonus from the world. Is right, what I, yeah, like sure. A complete like your collection yeah, sort of thing. Do that. Well, let's, let's, let's tell a little story of what... what you know, you heard, you've heard the name Newt Scamander. You know he wrote the Fantastic Beast book. Let's just see what he was about, and it'll be a nice excuse to have a look at what um, the magical world is like in America um, and at a different yeah. time fine like yeah no do that do a little adventure like i don't understand this insistence on turning everything into a big grand franchise thing i don't know if it was jk's plan or if it was warner brothers because warner brothers saw piles of money uh, and thought they they were for the taking um that has backfired because i mean that was just that's a deeply incompetent choice um it's so it's so i'm so if if the trend continues mm-hmm. and four does as bad as three I'm so intrigued as to, you know, are they going to make that bold decision to pull can the... Because isn't, isn't it meant to can, go up to five? It's So, well, I'm, I'm going to put this out there now, Chris. I don't think there's going to be any more. I think we're done. Right. Yeah. I think we're done. But that wasn't uh, the plan, It is supposed to be five. There? So, well, so the very, very it's earliest plan was three. Then before, I think, before or around the release of the first one, JK changed it to five. Um, or someone changed it to five. Um, I think she was the one who mentioned it, but it was it was clear the plan then became five movies. And then after the second one didn't perform as well, there was something ignoring about that. And uh, this next one, this the third one came out, and obviously then it was like yeah, didn't, did not do did not do well. Um, so yeah, yeah, we'll see. I, I have a funny feeling, Chris. Well, look, put it this way: they they writing or casting, as far as I'm aware, any fourth movie right now yeah so, so I'm, on, uh, I'm on the wikipedia now so in february 2022 obviously this year producer david hyman uh, re- revealed that the script for fantastic beast 4 had not begun in april 2022 variety reported that warner brothers green lighting the, fir- the final two installments would depend on the critical and commercial performance of the secret the secrets of dumbledore which yeah. obviously did not do particularly well so for me, I think we're already done with these. Mm. Uh, I think I don't think there's any more of these coming out. And I and, I, and you know what? Rightly so. I think it is. I think it makes f- an absolute boatload of sense to my brain that the audiences just rejected these movies outright. Yeah, and for for context of not doing that well, it is currently the ninth grossing film of the year as we sit in September. Um, but it, comparatively to the other films in the series, um, right. a box office of four hundred and five point two million isn't isn't a success, especially well, when the reported budget is two hundred million, which you double because of marketing. Yeah. So that's four hundred million spent to m- release the movie. Then you, how much did you say it made? Uh, according to uh, Wikipedia, four hundred four hundred and five point two million. Great, they made five million. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That doesn't seem like a worthy I, investment to me, and especially no. as it's declining, I don't see any way we get another one of these. And 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 and, and I just like this is how bad it is. Like the one I've seen the most recently, I've had to just look up which countries it's set in because you know we were talking about, and I was like, wait, where is the third one set? It's set somewhere. It's partially China, partially Germany. So there you go. Right. Okay. I, and the fact that I'd already forgotten that tells you how much we get to explore those cultures, <laughs> those the yeah, wizarding yeah. versions of those cultures. Yeah. For sure. Hmm. For sure. Um, right. The uh, 
The so Newt Newt is Newt good at his job. Nope. So <laughs> one of my favourite scenes in the movie though, one of my one scene that I was like, oh this is good, and I think I think I didn't think this at the time, but I think like within this discussion I'm realising maybe the reason I was like, oh that's a fun scene is because it was actually me subconsciously going, oh he he is he's good at his job. Okay, cool. Um, the scene where he before it all goes wrong is about to trap the beast in back into the box in Central Park. And he's doing the whole... He's almost dancing, um, and he's doing this whole kind of routine, and we can really see his relationship and control over the animals. And obviously, Jacob accidentally... <laughs> like, Well, weirdly, like something happens in the background which makes the musk knock enough that it brings their attention to Jacob. Jacob then runs, as far as I can tell, holding it. Um, but, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, but that that scene I quite enjoyed, and maybe for that reason of it's it's a display of competency. <laughs> See, I don't... Because like, the problem with that is, right, so I, I think if you've got loads of examples of Newt being competent in the rest of the movie, then Newt doing a silly dance to tame an animal is fine. But when he's incompetent through the rest of the movie, because the dance is the dance looks silly, you just think it's him being clueless again. You could easily interpret it that way, I think. The best example of competency from him in the movie is the scene when they first go into the case and visit the magical world that's in the case where all the animals live. Mm. Because in it, he's like feeding them, he's knowledgeable about them, he's explaining about them, he's talking about his love for them and how he's slowly trying to get the magical magical world to understand they're not as dangerous as they think they are. Like, he's clearly... Like, that's the best characterization of Newt in the entire movie, top to bottom, for me. Mm. Um, that's well, it's also, it's one of the most magical scenes in the movie as well. Right. Like, yeah. I think it's a bit long. I think we spend, I think, again, it felt like a bit like J.K. Rowling was going, well, it's called Fantastic Beast. I better chuck a lot of beasts into this sequence. Yeah, so I mean, it, it, because it's one of the best scenes in the movie, I didn't mind. But in any, if the rest of the movie was of, of a reasonable quality, I would agree with you. <laughs> but because, yeah, because no, the, rest just... of the, the quality of the rest of the movie is so abysmal in places, like I was, I was quite happy to stay in the scene. I wasn't, you know, that I that I was enjoying, that I wasn't hating, you know. Uh, yeah. But I don't think yeah, that's, that's a reflection. Fair. I think you're right in a lot in the in the grand scheme of things, the scene is too long. But for me, just because I was enjoying it and that was nice for a change of pace, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that I was I was happy for it to continue. Um, yeah. No, it, I, under, I understand where that comes from. Yeah. Yeah, because because he's you know in it he's like he, he's again he shows knowledgeable he's like he's friendly with him they they he's clearly like a like a like the equivalent to a to a to a tamer he's kind of got the uh, Chris Pratt from Jurassic World thing where like some of these animals that are dangerous still seem to trust him like that uh, the Thunderbird will let him pet and stroke him but he says to Jacob maybe stay back with this one not great with strangers like he, he he comes across very knowledgeable in that scene and he knows exactly what he should be doing he's running around feeding them all and it just becomes clear how good he of a care he's taking of these animals and you realize oh he does know his stuff but the rest of the movie they get out and he's just like burr, 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 burr. and like sometimes they get good comedy out of it like the, the the niffler in the jewelry store scene that's later that's before they go to the park mm. is one of the better scenes for comedy in the movie um, but it's also a real bad example of him just like just running around like a lunatic instead of having a plan. Like the the, the, the Niffler's in the jewelry store, and there's the the joke is that it like holds still in the window so he won't see it, and then he does. But then like they have this thing where he goes into this jewelry store and he's like chasing it around and it's crashing into everything and he's hanging from a chandelier. And then we cut to the outside and you've got Jacob just on the street like while this chaos happens behind him. And then there's the brilliant joke when the police shop and they're all covered in jewels and things and they're like, oh, they went that way, officers, even though obviously. <laughs> You know, they're all. You know, they're obviously the people they're looking for. You know, that's that's all fine. Um, you know, I, I, as a joke, but it's just I don't know how charming it is that Newt New is that inept. You know, I, I, I he's causing half of the problems in this movie by being shit at his job. Like when he goes, I should really get that fixed regarding the case. I'm like, dude, yeah, you really fucking should. You, you, your goal is to make people not scared of these animals. Well, you know what's not helping? Letting them fucking loose. Not to You're mention really angry at Newt. What's that say? 
You're just really angry at Newt. I'm beginning to think you just don't like Eddie Redmayne. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of Eddie Redmayne, if I'm being honest, but different, that's a different story. <laughs> not getting into that. But oh, then, and then there's like things like, they do things like they show his incompetence in that he doesn't even know which animals are missing. There's a point when we know factually at least three animals are missing still. And he goes, one left. And I'm like, but we've, we've seen three. So the audience knows more than the lead in this moment. We, we shouldn't know more than him. He should have gone down into that case and immediately known what was missing. Because that's what a competent person in his situation would. He'd have a thorough count of which animals were there. Well, he never even catches the billywig. The billywig is just still out there. <laughs> Fine, apparently. That's allowed. <laughs> the movie ends and that's still running around. Yeah. We no, never catch right. that one. We see that one get out. We never see it again. It's <laughs> what a little a little fun post credit sequence with them maybe would have been would have been fun. But sure, yeah. sure he catches the we see him you know catching the Billy Wig in a net or something. It's fine. It's a little bug. It doesn't matter. It's not it's not a big deal. I'm not saying like that's movie breaking or anything. But it just builds this picture of Newt being utterly incompetent. That's just mind melting because I just don't understand. Like he's the hero. <laughs> He's, his whole thing is he's good with animals. <laughs> it's his only thing. How do you get that wrong? I don't understand. Madness. I can't. I'm looking. I'm looking forward to seeing. Like I saw. I saw. I saw earlier the trailer for Crimes, and I just, you know, there's a bit where Dumbledore's like, "It can't be me. It has to be you." Uh-huh. And I'm like, I cannot wait to see what their logic is for keeping Newt involved. <laughs> In this stuff. It's great. Oh, wait till you get to the third one, mate. Oh, oh, the horse that picks the president. Oh, delicious. I can't wait. It's so good. It's so <laughs> um, yeah, so you're right. And and every, like, but it is also, there's no, as we've already mentioned, there's no ABC. Like, as well as no. him seeming a bit inept, the character doesn't seem to learn anything, grow, mm. change, and you just come out feeling more in a way for... Tina, Queenie, and certainly Jacob. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. And I just think, like, you just, I, I, I can't fathom a world where that's your lead character, and you put that little thought into your lead character, mm. and characterizing him. Because as far as I can see, there are two scenes where he comes across as like an interesting character that I want to spend time with, and it's 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 the, in the suitcase when he first brings in Jacob, and then when he makes the bold choice to talk. To the obscurus instead of fighting it. That's great. Mm. Love both of those things. And oh, and I, I guess, yeah. I guess, well, this is part of the in the case bit. But when they explain th- the reason he has a sort of separated magical presence of an obscurus in in that protective bubble, because he couldn't save the little girl. We haven't talked about this actually. We should talk about this. The little girl. You, you, the backstory apparently is that he went to a place. There's, I think he said, did he say Sudan? Maybe I can't remember where it was. I, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm pulling it. Nothing there. It might not be sounding. But he went to another country. There's a little girl infected with an obscurus. He couldn't save her, but he did separate the obscurus at the last moment and has that, I guess, to study so he can save the next one. Um, so he has a personal investment in credence, I guess. But is that? Do you think that's elaborated on enough to be anything for a plot? No, I didn't actually make the connection between that and how he then uh, he tries to talk to Cadence and save him so much at the end. So no, I don't think they, I don't think they expand on that as much as they should have. Um, I would almost it, say uh, potentially because and there's, there there are places you could do it because another scene that I did actually quite like. And actually, I think shows a bit of uh, another example of characterization for Newt is when he's telling Queenie to get out of his memory. And she's like digging into his memory about um, the Lestrange and how, um, you know, he was clearly like let down or something by her. Mm-hmm. What if the thing she's digging into his memory about is what happened with that little girl? And his mm. pain and shame, he, he shouldn't view it that way, but his shame at not being able to save her. And if we, you know, if you put that scene in, suddenly him rushing to and doing all he can to save Credence at the end has a bit more weight to it. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think they, 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 they have all these, oh, so many threads they could have chosen to pull on. Yeah. 
that would have, I think, helped with these characters. But you'd need to focus on one, not having so many. It's weird that this has come back to similar issues to the other ones, though, considering this isn't based on a book. Well, yeah, because how many times did we say that in the films, what was Harry's growth? Like, Harry was just there to do things. Right, and it's and it's the same for Newt here. And that's a real shame, and a real shame coming from Rowling. I don't know if she just, like, got a bit too sort of, like, planning a book <laughs> to, to, to do this correctly. You know what I mean? Like, I'd almost like to see her tackle the, this as a book now, just get it all fleshed out and smoothed out and rewritten and cleared up and, you know, made a little bit cleaner. Because I feel like there's potentially, like, a good book in this, which is hilarious. Well, apparently, the, the th- I don't know if it's the script or there, the script there is, is a there, yeah. book of the third one available, which apparently is much better. Like, oh, that's it expands I don't know it. about that. But I know, I know they released this as a script. This, this yeah. so there's a fantastic piece in where to find the book that the comic relief one from a few years back, which I've which I've got, and then from you got years and years ago, which was which was just to raise money for charity, which is well, I had it. I, I don't think I ever properly read it. In fact, if memory serves, I've got it's fantastic piece in where to find them in Quidditch through the ages, and I think one of them, the best thing about it is it's supposed to be Harry's actual textbook. So it's got a bunch of like scribbles and notes from Harry, like Harry and Ron clearly playing a game of noughts and crosses in their textbook and writing messages to each other and stuff. So that's fun. But the rest of the book yeah, is just like descriptions of beasts. Um, so that, that exists. Yeah. That was a comic relief thing that I, that I, that I supported because it was a good, it's a good charity. And then otherwise the rest of that book is quite dull. It's just lists of the beasts from Harry, the Harry Potter world and what they do and are. And then they've recently, uh, as recently as the movie, I think put out a book called Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. That is the script of this film. The, the same way they did it with Cursed Child. Which is pointless, by the way, because you just watched the film. With Cursed Child, not everyone can see Cursed Child. I am, I know why you put out the script for that play. I don't know why you put out the script for this movie. Yeah, well, it looks like they've put out the scripts for all of them. And yeah, people are saying that, that the detail in the commentary and the fact that it's, I think, maybe it even contains cut scenes for the third makes it better. Um, I think I saw a video title looking at it as well interesting but yeah all of all, all of these have come out as screenplays but you know what that is that's you know then rowling gets to technically release a book uh, about it you know mm. Mm. um what um what did you think of queenie i thought queenie was another great character i thought she was um played excellently um you know engaging um i thought you know her the way she used her powers um to get what she wanted for the escape when they were trying to save them was quite a nice moment of characterization uh her growth kind of she goes from being this sort of airy kind of woman who's a bit of way with the fairies when they um first meet her but then by the end you know has sort of fallen for this guy and is a bit more maybe um willing to jump into the action that she seems at first um so yeah i thought i thought queenie all of the main four were portrayed well but we've not really touched upon queenie yet so what were your thoughts on queenie yeah i think she's a fun character i think um uh, the idea of having like a almost a natural born legilimens is interesting because so you know when they refer in the in the in, in the books and the movies of the the original uh eight um to you know, I think I think Snape says to Harry at one point, you know, like Voldemort's a very accomplished legilimens. They mean it in an academic sense, like they're a doctor of, they're you know, he's a master of this particular kind of magic. They've kind of slightly recontextualized it here by giving Queenie sort of like psychic powers that seem to be of her own development, like that she's like natural development rather than she studied. Because if you were a accomplished legilimens. You, you, I don't think you'd be serving tea at the ministry, would you? You, you, they, they probably have a use for you, right? Like, in government, like, mm. oh, um, we're in court. These, this, this, this guy is claiming he didn't kill all those people. Uh, Queenie, yeah, he did. Cool. Next, like, I, yeah. <laughs> sometimes yeah. I do wonder in a world where reading minds exists and also removing people's memories and watching them yourself exists. I don't know why there's a court system of any kind or a juries of any kind <laughs> seems seems redundant yeah that's a bit but, of a problem oh. in general with the series isn't it like uh, like there's 
there's time travel and there's there's controlling people and there's reading people's minds and there's every mode of transport you could imagine like you know there's there are that you could probably point at almost any given scene and and be like why aren't they using that as as in as we find in the book when in the books when it gets to a point where you have to spend time having the well, why aren't we doing this conversations actually on that i thought it was interesting that <laughs> I don't mean this as an insult in a way. It's just the best way to describe the idea. They use they use apparition in this film in the way that when you were a kid and you read about apparition, you sort of imagined it being used in fight scenes and action scenes where they go from one side to the other, which I thought was interesting because apparition isn't really used like that in Harry Potter. And in this it felt like apparition was used a lot more. And in that sort of, if you were playing, you know, when you were a kid, that you could move from one place to another, the scenario in which you'd do that would be if you were getting chased or or something like that. So I thought it, their use of um, apparition was interesting. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's uh, the visualization of the apparition is always interesting in these movies as well because it seems to have shifted like quite a lot across the movies. Um, yeah. But yeah, they, they use it. I think in this movie it's used reasonably well. I think they, they do use it to get out of dark, difficult situations pretty frequently, which is like smart, right? Like that is what you would do. So, yeah. I, you know, that's, uh, I, think, I think you're right. Like that's, that, that functions pretty well. Here. I, yeah, the I use of magic because... in general, though, is pretty. That we we come to the worst example of gun wands I've ever seen in a movie. In one of these movies, in the later yes, movie, we'll come to that. But y- yeah, because I think that just to, to say about the apparition, because actually, you know, we're seeing it. This is the first time, and it's used more story wise in Harry Potter in the seventh seventh book, because obviously we're suddenly out of the school, so suddenly it's an option a lot more. And I thought it was an interesting choice to go in a world where this is an option. Actually, it gets used a lot more for this purpose. Um, I thought that was quite good. Yeah. Um, the yeah, there's there's one guns really bad in that um, in that scene. It's just not good, is it? They're literally banging like guns now in a way they weren't even yeah. doing in the last one. The the biggest magical crimes of these movies in terms of display magic, the two things they keep doing that I fucking hate every time I see it is wand beams, which is two powerful wizards come up against each other, and instead of showing them use magic to, I don't know, do things, they both point the wands at each other and beams of light touch in the middle and then nothing happens to either of them. And that's supposed to be exciting and visually interesting and tense, apparently. That's supposed to be action. That's what that's what qualifies as action. That's crime number one. This movie does it, uh, does it between, I think it's Tina and Grindelwald. It's not Grindelwald. I think at one point. It's... They, yeah, I think it's Grindelwald, isn't it? Yeah, but it's before he's bef- it's when he's before he's revealed as Grindelwald. It's while he's he's, yeah, he's yeah, still he's Colin still Farrell, he's, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's the Colin Farrell Grindelwald. But yeah, they have a they have a wand beam off, and I fucking hate it. I hate it every time. Um, I think is it? I can't remember who it is. There's a podcast I listen to that refers to those as a progress beam fight, a progress bar fight, where like you know, it just we whoever's progress bar gets the largest wins, <laughs> which is a funny way to think of it. Um, but like in terms of it, it might be Nando V movies. I can't remember, but someone refers to it as that, and I find that very funny. Um, but then you, you know, crime number two is the the gun ones, which you've already talked about extensively. But here they really do. It's like a flash and a bang. They've made it look even more like a gun now, and sound even more like a gun. Like I could not believe it when I was watching it. It was like. It was like they'd heard the criticism and just went fuck you and doubled down. It was like a deliberate. Let's do that. Awful. Just awful. But while we're on this subject, let's just talk about magic in general in this movie. I actually think beyond the uh, really, really frustrating use of gun ones at the ends and the progress beam or whatever you want to call it, the, the beam battle, I think there is a lot of like genuine, like interesting use of magic in the movie. Um, yeah, I'd agree with that. You know, they're often, you know, aside from apparition, they're often using things like Alohomora to try and get through locks, or they're trying. They're, they're often trying to solve their problems with actual magic spells. They use Axio. You know, there's a, there's a there's a reasonable variety of magic used across this, and I think that's obviously a result of J.K. writing it. I guess because if anyone understands all the potential spells that are available in this world, 
it's 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 her you know like mm. she 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 you know she does she does get it like when he's fighting the niffler he does use like a weird spell to like drag it towards him and stick it in the glass you know there's i don't know there's there's just quite a lot of like interesting different magic used throughout so until you get to that weird ending where everyone's using gun wands and grindelwald keeps using telekinesis with his hand not his wand i i need to ask about that do you do, what's 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 the deal with that he does it like four times. Like someone's coming at him and like he's shooting at them with the wand and then he uses his other free hand to like drag a car over and launch it at them or pull up the train tracks. And he keeps doing it. And I'm like, did we establish he could do this at any point? What is this? Yeah, that is weird. Because when I first saw it, I just was like, oh, he's just that powerful. But yeah, it's not something we've ever seen anyone else do. And it's sort of, I guess the problem is in a world where you can say a spell in your head and not need to say it out loud, maybe right. he's saying the spell and doing the accompanying <clears throat> movement. So you could but probably But the movement is with his hand, not his wand. That's a weird choice, right? Yeah, but the spell could be, follow my hand, cuss. <laughs> like, you know. It's, oh, it's, it's, right. It's, I see what you're saying. So he, he's doing a non-verbal spell. That means he's briefly granted some weird telekinesis over physical matter, or something. I mean, it's nature. pure cast. It's pure class uh, fan splaining, but you yeah. could make that argument. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it should it's... be because it's a new power. It should probably be explained um, within the mm. text, um, which it definitely isn't. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um... I, I, yeah, so on the whole, in terms of how magic is used across the movie, I, I think generally it's pretty good, but it, David Yates just fucking David Yates is all over the last act and it's fucking terrible. Um, I, I don't mind. I tell you what, I do actually. I really do like the visual of the Obscurus, and I really like the visual of. In fact, I think this movie might be one of the best visually of all the Harry Potter films. Putting that out there, mm. I think seeing New York, you know, having these, you know, these beasts sweep through New York and. You know, the you know, the obscurus particularly, I think, you know, looks pretty cool and interesting. I think I know it's like a big black cloud of death or whatever, and that, that doesn't seem particularly imaginative, but the way you see it breaking so, apart buildings and stuff, I kinda like. I think that's interesting. Yeah, I think it um you know, we've seen we've seen a lot of villains destroying cities recently, but actually, um it is a cool visual and I tell you one thing for the for the um you know, for the the look of the film, it's it's probably the first in the series where the colours feel right. When when it needs to be dark, it's dark. When it needs to be bright, it's bright. When it needs to be this sort of magical world of the suitcase, it's this magical world of the suitcase. When it needs to be the the sort of gr- grungier fifties New York, it's the grungier fifty New York. It's like oh, brilliant! Like you know no color correction needed have a tick <laughs> like, yeah, cause, yeah cause to... even within the, within the case sequence depending on the different portions of the case which are obviously divided into different visuals for like depending on you know because he's, he's obviously got different like terrain in there for the different creatures right so like the, the the thunderbird has a big open like desert plain to live in because it's from arizona mm. so that makes sense like actually yeah i think that's I think you're right. I think that's, you know, it's really colourful and, like, well done. And it's not, you know... Yeah, you know what? I would say this isn't shot flatly either, 100%, like the last one. I think there's some interesting shot choices. This is still Yates, right? I'm not going mad. Because, actually, having just sat through, like, a week ago or whatever, a week and a bit ago, fucking the mess that was Deathly Hallows Part 2, which is just the most horribly shot. Yeah, it it is still the Yates, yeah. Yeah, wow. Okay. I'm going to... I'm maybe say, may, maybe um, he just needed a gap. Maybe some of the problems with those earlier movies, uh, those, those those sorry, those final movies of the previous franchise were just bogged down with with the cycle. You know, we just finish one movie, do the next. You know, like that whole you know getting them out one a year or whatever was maybe that was 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 hurting the production. Yeah, because the only the the only thing he did in between was the the Legend of Tarzan. Oh, which was a bad movie. Okay, cool. It was a bad movie. And he did that. So basically, uh, Hallows Part 2 was, well, came out 2011, Tarzan 2016, uh, same year as Fantastic Beasts. So that would suggest maybe he did have a bit of a break and then did those two movies. Right. Well, he, look, he, he, he got he either got more time to plan this one out or he got more time on, during production to like actually make the shots interesting and then like, you know, not terrible looking. I mean, there's still some <laughs> flat shots, but like, you know, when it's two characters talking, I don't care. Like at least the dynamic stuff 
is dynamic. Like, the, you know, when the camera's sweeping through New York with the Obscurus, it's a cool choice. I like that. It works. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it. With the with the exception of Azkaban, it's probably the best looking film in the series. Yeah, I think it might be. I think it, it it's certainly up there, right? I think I think it has mm. got a real good and I, and I Order, think that's, all, that's Order not... also looks brilliant, but yeah, no, I I think it's I think it's up there. And I and I think one thing that we haven't credited yet, which does deserve a lot of the, the, the you know, the the, the uh the th- you know, the, the credit for this. Obviously, the other thing that's great about this movie is the production design. These are things we don't normally talk about. Chris and I, uh, for those of you who already know, we'll do, sorry for repeating ourselves, but Chris and I study screenwriting. We're story guys. We talk about the characters and the narrative, and we often overlook other elements of filmmaking. Uh, look, if you need reviews that go into the details of those, find a reviewer that knows more about those things, understands those things better, and is more willing to talk about them in detail. But... I know what I like, and I think the production design in this movie is fantastic. I think the costumes are great. I think the sets are cool. I like the 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 the, the way they've realised like what is it, nineteen twenties New York. Um, uh, it, it, it's good. Looks good. Yeah, because it also another scene that looks brilliant that we've not touched upon because our suitcase sort of has naturally become the go-to. But the um, the bar when they go to that bar. Yes. And talk to that villain guy who then sells them out who wants the the plant. Like mm-hmm. that that looks brilliant. Like it looks really great. And it feels like it feels like the doors have been kicked open and when you're not when because JK's not restricted to the school or, you know, things you know, the ministry and, and kind of those environments, she's sort of, you know, exploring bars and, and things that she couldn't before. So yeah, I think uh, that stuff looks brilliant. Yeah, like cool little visual things, like, and I guess this is one of those things where you get to you get to write all the visual stuff into it because obviously she writes those books like she doesn't have to think too hard about what these things look like because she's you know she's she, it's what she's describing is what you're going to imagine and you can fill in the rest yourself like you can fill in a more Im- imaginative world at your own leisure but like little details like going into the bar they knock on like a wall that's got like a painting on it. And in a sort of almost like a Hogwarts style, but also it's new own thing. The sort of painting like looks up at them, and then they knock on it, and then the eyes tear back, and there's just like a, you know the bouncer of this club is just staring through the eyes of this otherwise like you know quite sort of ornate drawing that's there, replaced by this thuggish guy's eyes. Is is it's a really fun visual, and like then you go into the bar, and they've got like a singer, um, that's like dressed really uniquely. And using like singing along with magic, like using like the uh, wand to create like images out of sparkles, essentially in the air while singing. So it's like a, a you know, what does a show look like in the magical world? Like you know, you know, what you know, there's like sort of nineteen twenties, nineteen thirties, like you know, you go to a bar and there's like a singer, you know, that kind of thing. This movie's version, it's all very imaginative and works really well. And of course, one of my favorite jokes in the whole movie is in that section. I'll, I'm going to say it now because we're here. But um, well, you never seen a house elf before? <laughs> yeah, I love house elves. My uncle's a house elf. <laughs> my it, uncle's yeah. a house elf is one of the greatest things I've ever seen. Also, a house elf with a New York accent. Mm, mwah, yes, thank you. He's so good. It's I think such, I did not know I wanted, delivery. but I'm so glad I got. <laughs> yeah, such good, such good delivery on Dan Fogelman's part. I, like, yeah, yep. brilliant. Yep, yep, yep. And as well, I mean, the, the, let's not, let, you know, we haven't, you know, so production design, great. The hairstyles, the, the outfits, the, the look of the sets, all of that, great. A uh, bit more time and care put into the shot comp- composition from Yates compared to the previous ones. And then, you know, let's talk about the other element of the visuals of this movie, the special effects. And let me tell you, pretty good. I Like, yeah, at no, yeah, no, sure. no point did the beasts look like they weren't there interacting with the world. I didn't see any dodgy compositing. And it might be my standards are a bit skewed because normally we review movies, you know, <laughs> at latest, like, what, 2004 and backwards. Like, we, t- we tend not yeah. to do movies this recent, generally. So maybe my rewind reviews barometer for what a good special effect is is broken as shit. But that... um. The, the the my favorite beast from this whole movie, which is the uh, Okami, which is the, the 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 blue sort of snake bird thing that that can grow yeah, and shrink gonna, in size. It's, it's it's funny when you said the special effects are good. I was gonna bring up that bird and that scene where it's <sighs> filling every space. It's brilliant. It's yeah. beautiful, right? Like that's great. Mm. It's this, it's this really nice blue plumage that like hits the light nicely. Man, we I, I I genuinely could if we're gonna spend some time complaining this movie, it's definitely not from the storytelling perspective. But I will say, from a sheer craft perspective and a visual perspective, 
And even actually, you know, I even like the music in this movie. The the music's good, right? Like it's 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 kind of reminiscent yeah. of what was done with the other ones, but it's got its own feel. It feels distinct. Yeah, it's exciting. It 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 moves in all the right places. The music, yeah, it's good. And the um the bird looks going back to the the bird that fills um the space yes. available, which is a brilliant concept, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, the you know even the visual of it going back into the teapot is great. I do yes. question how readily av- even in a dusty old shop how regularly available bugs suddenly are. Like if I was to turn to you now, Dan. And say, give me a bug. You you can't lay your hands on a bug instantly, can you? <laughs> no, but genuinely, Chris, well, as someone who stayed in, a, in, a, in an apartment in uh, Brooklyn, <laughs> off Marcy Ave, <laughs> if you'd have asked me when I was staying there to get you a bug, I would not have had trouble. <laughs> Ah, right. Fair I don't want to. I know. I don't want to disparage, but uh, New York is a uh, very buggy city. <laughs> Right. Okay. Um, Fair enough. I, and what's cool as well, even though the Okami, which is that sort of snake bird creature, has um, never uh, appeared in, uh, to my knowledge, any of the mainline books or films, it does actually. I've just pulled out my copy of Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, um, and found it. It's in here. Um, oh, nice. a, pl- a plumed, two-legged, winged creature with a serpentine body. It can reach a length of 15 feet. It may it feeds mainly on rats and birds that may have been known to carry off monkeys. It's aggressive to all who approach it, particularly in defense of its eggs, whose shells are made of purest, softest silver. So while it seems she has retconned the size element, because that's not in here, even the egg being made of silver is in the is in the book she wrote in what, like two thousand? So so speaking of that, to jump to that at the end. Where yes. Newt gives... Like, he doesn't know... He's had his memory erased. He doesn't fucking know what to do with these eggs. What are you talking about? Like, how is this helpful to him? <laughs> That's a good point. Because he, he clearly does use it to make his, 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 his bakery. Because the note basically says... Does the note say sell these? What does the note actually say? Maybe the note has enough information. That's a good question. I don't think it does. I think it just names them. And it's just like... it. It definitely says... To 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 give you a, a start for your bakery from a invested friend or something like that, right? But that's not a, that's not an it's because who's he who's he selling them to? Bearing in mind that it's a wizarding artifact. Well, I know. I think Newt says in earlier in the movie that they're made of pure silver, and silver is a valuable metal to to, to, to muggles and wizards alike. Um, well, yeah. Okay. So uh, th- th- that he said that's why they're often like pillaged, right? Um, but let me just quickly find out what the note says. Because does the note give him en- enough of... Inf- Here we go. All right. Um, in the note to Jacob. Dear Mr. Kowalski, you are wasted in a canning factory. Please take these eggshells as collateral for your bakery. A well-wisher. <laughs> so, I, so, I mean, the note is indicating they're valuable. Because you remember the reason he didn't get it loan at the beginning? So he doesn't sell the eggshells, actually. That's a really important note. Because please take these Occamy eggshells as collateral for your bakery, signed a well-wisher. Now, that's interesting. Because early in the movie, he goes to the bank and he tries to get the, the, the loan. And the bank's like, well, yeah, but if your business busts, you, we don't have any collateral. We don't have anything we can take off you of value. You, if you want this loan, we've, you, we've got to know that we can recoup it if you screw this up. He has nothing to offer them, so he can't get his loan. So that seems like to me he's given something of value, like made of pure silver, that he can go into the bank and be like, look, this is the thing I own that's worth something. Give me my loan so I can start my bakery. And like, if I screw it up, you can have these. And the bank, I guess, would yeah, probably know what to do with silver. I guess. Or, it's, it's, although, it's thin, though. It's thin. Yeah, but although mm, he wouldn't remember his first trip to the bank because that was a bad memory. So <laughs> that's the problem there. Um, so yeah, we've done so we've done some good stuff. Um, let's talk about some other things that don't make sense. Uh, Chris, death penalty. Does America have a death penalty in this? Does the Wizarding World have a death penalty? What's with the weird death pool of memories and you die? I don't understand. Like, <laughs> what? Did, you, did that scene make any sense to you at all? Chair floating over no. a pool. What what is happening in this scene? Just, listeners, they... you might you might know. Let me know. I want to know. I'm I, I don't understand it. <laughs> 
Yeah, I've got no idea. Because, they, I mean, they seem to extract her memories as if they're literally taking them from them. And I, and I know we've seen that in other movies and it's not meant they no longer have the memories. But that's the, you know, the, the sort of the way her expression changes once they've gone sort of implies that. And then maybe the death comes from your bad memories over impact. You're like encompassing you, maybe. It doesn't make a lot of sense, Dan. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. I just don't think the movie explains it enough. Because, like, part of me goes, like, oh, it's like death soup. Like, you go, you like, it's like this is their version of the electric chair, right? You sit in the chair, mm. and then you, I mean, it seems extreme to set them, sentence them to death for, for, for this, but sure, fine. Okay, well, go, let's go with that. Um, We've already had a really clunky line of dialogue about. The, the American government aren't great. <laughs> I, I've written this down. Actually. Can I read this dialogue out, Chris? Because it's just an example of really bad dialogue in the movie. Um, mm. Mr. Scamander, do you know anything about the wizarding community in America? I do know a few things, actually. I know you have rather backwards laws about relations with non-magical people, uh, that you're not meant to befriend them, you can't marry them, which seems mildly absurd to me. Thanks, textbook. I am glad I now know something more about the American wizarding I, magical world. <laughs> I do have to say... And this is potentially gonna, you know, lead me to get some some grief, maybe in 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 the ye old comments. Um, obviously, usual caveat: J.K. Rowling has done a lot of awful things, uh, said a lot of awful things since, uh, you know, caused a lot of controversy uh, since since uh, Harry Potter. Um, but we've sort of always maintained, you know, the, the, in terms of what she produced, Harry Potter is a work of genius. Um, yes. Still maintain it would, that. It would be a lie but at it, this point for me to pretend those books aren't great. I loved them, read them many well, years before. This is the JK thing, right? got radicalised on the internet. <laughs> I'm I'm rereading them since I've basically reread everything since Goblet, since we've been doing this podcast, and I'm just about to start Deathly Hallows. Mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be bold here. J.K. Rowling's dialogue in general isn't always brilliant. Sometimes it's masterful, but sometimes, like, Harry, Ron, and Hermione are phrasing things, and I'm like, you wouldn't, like, a 17-year-old boy wouldn't phrase that like that. Like, it's phrased even in a in, very... Even in the ex 90s, Chris? <laughs> Yeah, like it's phrased. <laughs> Maybe it's kids in the nineties just talk different, Chris. A lot, a lot of her dialogue in general is very expositional, and it's very. Yeah, I think yeah. I see. You know, it's sort of funny you should say it because I'm, I'm, I'm. I, I said this when we started this series. I'm probably going to go back because I've been, I've been putting off a reread. You know, because we were going to do these. Mm. And you, you, you quite rightly, I think, were like, "Hey, Dan, you, you, you're." You're a big sad weirdo about these books. Don't reread them before we do this because they'll be too fresh in your memory. And while you'll probably get less stuff correct, you know, there's a couple of details I didn't get right. I don't think when we talked about these, uh, when, when I, although I caught one of them, I caught as I was saying it, which was the the wood, the storyline about wood having to get the Quidditch team to win because it was his last year. It was actually from Azkaban, not from uh, Phoenix where I accidentally placed it. Um, I corrected yeah. that at the time. But there's a couple of other things I missed. I, I did... I've, I've double-checked, and annoyingly, um, as much as we've criticised Columbus in Chamber of starting the problem with gun wands with the dueling sequence, when someone uses exp uh, Expelliarmus and it knocks a person over, that is in the book, turns out. Like, someone uses oh, Expelliarmus right. and the person goes over. It's the only time that happens in the book. Uh, but if you put it in a movie... All the other movies are going to do the same thing. So, some slight, you know. But you were right to say to me, like, don't reread them. Like, because I think I would have been even more pernickety about things that don't really matter. Um, but my memory of it is always that I've been very fond of her dialogue. Because I've always found it, generally speaking, that she's got a very good way of getting exposition into conversations. Um, where it makes... Perfect. Like basically, it's the Steven Universe frustration. Remember when we kept saying the, the, the whole show of Steven Universe collapses the minute you realise Steven never asks pertinent questions? And if he did, the show would be over in about 10 minutes. Because yeah. he should be asking these questions. And it's lucky that he's the sort of, they've characterised him as the sort of person that doesn't. Because otherwise you just kind of go, like, this doesn't really work. Because he he should immediately be saying, why is this this? What is this this? But Steven's this weird, happy-go-lucky child that's running around not caring about the details. And that's, they get away with it 
because of who Stephen is. But in the Harry Potter world, I think when you've got the characters like Harry, Hermione, and Ron, who are very inquisitive, that is like their design, of course they're going to be asking questions. So JK had a really good way of having the adults always not want to tell them certain things, and she always found ways to make that make sense, why they wouldn't want the kids to have that information. Azkaban's a great example. No one wants Harry to know that the word on the street is that Sirius was responsible for betraying his parents because they're worried the minute he finds out that he's going to run off after Sirius, get himself killed. So we have Harry asking the question, because he should be as a character in that moment, and the Wizarding World not answering it for the reason that they have. And we understand everyone's logic. And when we do finally get the answers, the dialogue that's used to do it is really well done, where it's like, of course he's going to ask this exact question at this exact moment. It always flows really naturally, I've found, in my, in my memory of it. But it is interesting to hear you say that in your rereading, that's not 100% always been the case. Is there any like, gratuitous yeah. examples of it you can think of or anything I should look out for when I go back through them? Any particular book where you found that to be a problem? I'm very curious about this. You've, you've definitely piqued some... my interest with that suggestion. Yeah, and it might, it, might be, it might be that there was just a specific scene in... I've just read The Half-Blood Prince, and it might be that there, there was a specific scene of Harry, Ron, Hermione talking, and I just felt that some of the language being used just didn't like it was kind of like if you said it if you were to say it out loud it would just feel too expositional and wouldn't feel very natural now it could just be that i happened to read that yesterday and that's you know clouding my judgment of this um and maybe that actually you won't find that at all um but yeah it was it was an observation while we were talking about dialogue of actually i think what you're describing of the dialogue here being too expeditional, I think you, there's a few examples that could be pointed to in uh, in the Harry Potter books about that as well. Do you think one of the reasons she maybe gets away with it in the books and less so here is just that the, the extra time given to it? A conversation doesn't have to be a few snippy sentences, yeah, or, then we're moving on to the next scene. Because a Hollywood movie moves or, at a clip that a book doesn't. <laughs> or... Or, you know what, it, c- it could be in general a book thing. Do you know what I mean? Like, books don't have the option to say someone looks really sad or, or do you know what I mean? Or shoot things a certain way. So I did, at, when, I disco- when I read it, I did then go, I wonder if that's just, you know, a fiction thing that actually it's mm. a way, always a little bit expositional in dialogue because you don't want to do everything in prose. Maybe. I don't know. Well, there you go. Yeah, I don't know. I I, just, I found that really, I found her dialogue to be disappointing in the movie for sure. I was very like, really like, come on. Like, I think of J.K. as having a better grasp of how to sneak exposition into dis- discussions in a way that it feels natural, and this is not great. I tell you what, though, I, I have got an example of good dialogue from this movie. Go for it. When they're in in the case scene, which we've complimented a couple times now, it's like one of the best scenes in the movie. When he and him and J.K. go down. Um, Jacob, after a while in there, says, uh, I've decided I don't think I'm dreaming. I ain't got the brains to make this up. <laughs> J- Jacob in general, man. I know I know. every time Jacob comes up, one of us says it, but what a character. Yeah, but I think that's a really good ex- sentence because I think it says a lot about Jacob, but, it, you know, yeah. uh, uh, as a character as well as being a funny joke. I think if you can if you can tell me something about a person and make me laugh in the same moment, I think that's like that's good writing, right? Like we have to we've got to acknowledge it when it happens, and I think that's one of those moments. So, speaking Dan, yeah. of great performance, uh-huh. great writing, a great character, uh-huh. and of course, phenomenal acting. Shall we talk about credence? <laughs> Mm. No, <laughs> I don't want to do this. Yeah, um, he's not great in this film, is he? That is Ramilla. <laughs> no, I don't know why you'd bring Credence back. Even like it's just it, it's not. And I look, I don't think it's written to be. I think there are definitely performance choices that like many are actor, many an actor wouldn't have done. Um, but there's not a lot of good stuff on the page for Credence's there either. Like, so, I mean, I'll tell you what was thought and understood at the time of this movie. I don't want to spoil where this goes, but I'll tell you why everyone who watched this movie was absolutely certain Credence was playing some part, sort of part into the subsequent movies. The leading theory was that Ariana Dumbledore was an Obscurus. Ah, uh, right. And Grindelwald's interest in Credence, 
was more than just revealing to the wizard world. Mm. The, 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 you know, that's, that was the leading theory when this movie came out. Right, um, okay. uh, because they, they describe somebody who is forced not to let their magic out, having it turn inward and drive them, like it's in this movie, which is very similar to how it is phrased when Aberforth talks about it in the, 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 the final book. Mm. So, you know, I, 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 you know, I'm just gonna, I'll put that out there. Is that I, the, 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 the obscurest thing doesn't seem to have been an accident. Felt very deliberate right. at the, at the time. And it is, it, it is a very interesting idea. I think, you know, as an idea for a villain, it's, it, you know, it's almost better than how you have to execute that in this, which is, you know, a monster destroying a city. Um, Mm -hmm. And actually maybe almost more scenes of more of Newt and and Credence talking more of because I don't were you the first time you watched it. Were you surprised that it was actually Credence? I I wasn't personally. No, that's actually one of my big questions was like because JK goes through a lot of trouble to put mysteries into this movie. And I don't think either of them are particularly good. I think one's not good because it's obvious as crap. And the other one is not good because it comes out of nowhere and it still isn't satisfying. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, uh, I kind of called Credence pretty much, t- you know, two minutes into the movie. Because um, they yeah. set up his, like, is it his younger sister in the cult as being, like, the likely candidate for being the Obscurio, like, the Obscurus, whatever you want to call it, you know. And, you know, I, like, so I think the character is called Modesty. Modesty. So, so it's Credence Barebone, Modesty Barebone. And chastity barebone. These are that's this is bad names. This is JK. Stop it. Bad JK. Um, but modesty barebone is uh, sort of set up in the movie way too overtly to be the obscurest. And like you've got fucking Ezra Miller mugging at the camera sh- with his shoulders high and his head down the whole movie, mumbling to himself or whatever. And it's like, well, <laughs> which of these characters do you think it is? <laughs> it's not a great mystery. I don't think Ezra Miller's performance helps it. Um, and on top of that, I just don't think it's like, why, what does the movie, what does the movie gain from that being a mystery? That's my question. Mm. Well, Is it there because like, the books had mysteries? Every, every Harry Potter book had a thing that got revealed at the end that you didn't know? I guess you get, well, I, I guess from a practical point, plot point of view, you it gains Grindelwald getting to sort of chase him and we not know why and and get the sense that maybe he's up to something and is the bad guy and all of that sort of stuff maybe. Mm-hmm. But even then, it doesn't send the the Grindelwald in general, which I assume is maybe your second mystery that's done badly. So you so using it's like just purely an execution thing. Like if she'd have done the mystery better, it wouldn't have been a problem. Uh, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It still doesn't gain any. I guess I'm, try- I'm trying to say. I'm trying to think what the reasons could be. What what in her head it would gain. Um, but right. I don't think it it doesn't gain anything. No. And were you were you, in terms of your second mystery? Were you talking about the fact that obviously, um, Colin Farrell is Grindelwald? Right. Yeah. Which like when you so, watch it, knowing uh, that there's there are a few like hints, but like it's, but it's so uh, it's so. B- it's so dependent on prior knowledge of the Grindelwald character. Yes. Like, uh, th- other than the flash of blonde hair and not seeing the face in the prophet at the beginning, I just don't see how that's a reveal for anyone, really. Like, you, th- again, this film, in the way that the other films have to function without you knowing the books, I'm sorry, this film has to function without you being a Harry Potter fan. And yes. I'm going, wait, Grindelwald... So who is Grindelwald? Like, why are you not chucking in some dialogue about how Grindelwald's trying to tear down, you know, the relations between muggles and wizards. Or that something. is that. Like, it's, in the, it's in the opening of the movie. It's literally the movie opens on the newspapers and stuff about Grindelwald. But it's, but then, but it's just, then forgotten. I, I, completely. And but I acknowledge, I acknowledge it's in the prophet. I'm saying dialogue. Put it, in, put it into the film, throughout yeah. the film. Embed yeah. it in dialogue and scenes throughout the entire movie. Because mm. otherwise, it's, otherwise, that reveal literally feels like, as it was at the time, because his casting wasn't announced prior to the film's release, it feels like the reveal is actually Johnny Depp. 
and not the character. Right. I was. This is the point. I was. Right. Yeah. I was just about to say this. It, that is the reveal. And I remember what, what I because I I got to see this a couple days before it came out. So like no one knew. Like it was not public knowledge. And I remember the the the, <laughs> the 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 noise that the audience made is unlike anything else I've ever sat through in a cinema. It was like eh, eh, eh. like no one really knew what was happening. Because yeah. it was, it was half like, oh, it's jo- Johnny Depp's in this movie now. Like it was such, and then it's like, ah, oh, it's you, Grindelwald, and he's basically doing his, you know, and I could have gone away with it too if it wasn't for you meddling kids. Like he's doing his all, you know, mugging at yeah. the camera thing, and it's like, you're right, it, it, it's set up to whiz round and show his face and be like, Johnny Depp's in this movie, <laughs> which is yeah. so strange. And and not I don't you know I don't like it when uh, you know outside sort of promotional cast it's it's an out it's an outside force affecting the movie uh, mm-hmm. and the way that unfolds and uh, yeah it just it it damages it when you watch it just as a film like it it doesn't that end bit doesn't work I think partly for that reason. Yeah, exactly. And I think that is it. And it's just it's just distracting. And like also what bad casting anyway? Like why why would you make Grindelwald Johnny Depp? <laughs> well, considering how much we complimented the casting in these movies. I guess they did occasionally get one really wrong, like with Dumbledore and stuff, so maybe it's not too shocking. But that's just bad casting. I was saying at the time but, that it should be that it should have been Mads Mickelson. Who is yeah, ironically who they the- eventually make Grindelwald, <laughs> but yeah. But at the time, he was you. You've managed to execute a scenario where you've cast it. You've cast the the greats of of British acting, uh, and you know the, the 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 British Hollywood stars of the day. You know, nearly all all made their way through Harry Potter. This this is your opportunity to do that with an American. I I think in the in the filmmakers' heads. I'm not saying this is right at all. But in the filmmakers' heads, it had to be Johnny Depp or Brad Pitt or Matt Damon. It had to be a huge American movie star. Is that now? Is that just because like, oh, we're doing one that's in America now? We can finally get away from J.K.'s weird rule of like, no, no Americans pretending to be Brits. Because obviously those from, those from, yeah. from, from the point of view of the filmmakers, from the point of view of Warner Brothers, I I I would. I'd not be shy in making a bet that that you know I hedge, I'd hedge my bets. That was it, wouldn't you? Yeah, I, I, frustratingly, I think you're probably right. I think you're probably right. But I, I, I still, well, I, wouldn't, well, I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't well, want to. I, I although wanna having, that. although having said that, with all due respect, you know the the actors playing Tina, Queenie, and Jacob aren't particularly well known. So maybe that counteracts what I'm saying. They did sneak Ron Perlman in though, so yeah, I had a real that took me that took me out of that scene. Yeah, like, it did. It's, it's because Perlman. it's one of those things where like it's because it, he's playing a sort of like sort of CGI like kind of half. I don't know. Was he like a goblin or a house of? I, I couldn't quite tell what species he was supposed to be, but he was some sort of like you know he was he was he was the he was like a boss of like a like a speakeasy like a wizard, secret wizard speakeasy. He was like the, 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 almost like the mob boss that runs the place, and he has—he's the guy you go to who's got info about what's going on in New York and stuff. And he like he betrays Newt and that, but like it was so strange to me because it was so—it was clearly Ron Perlman's face and voice. But I was just like, have they made him? Is this actually Ron Perlman, or have they gone? Oh, let's make him a Ron Perlman type, and they've got like a voice alike and a like. CGI to the creature to look a bit like Ron Perlman, but uh, yeah, thankfully when the credits came up, it's like, oh yeah, it's actually Ron Perlman. But yeah, that was strange. That did take me out of it a bit because there was just a moment of like, is this him? Mm. And yeah. and actually thinking about it, maybe maybe we are wrong with that because Colin Farrell's not a big American movie star, is he? He's obviously well, obviously he is. He's a big he's a big movie star in America, but he's not. He's that's not taking advantage of the opportunity to cast an American. No, I guess not. So I guess, yeah, or maybe Johnny Depp was the one concession then to that. Yeah, maybe. Weird, but I don't know. I'm fascinated. Yeah, the, the, I'm fascinated. I, I, the way to that see... scene is shot really doesn't help because it is like a big reveal no. of his face. No. But it's like, no. well, wait a minute. We haven't. The, this is the problem when you do. So let's okay. Let's live in a world where you don't cast um, Johnny Depp, right? You cast anyone else. Doesn't matter. Literally anyone else. Someone that's not a household name. Johnny Depp's level. 
So pretty much any actor that's like further down the line, right? You do the opening scene. You show his face in the opening scene. Yeah. So you know yeah, what yeah. Grindelwald looks like. Because they just show the back of his head on the newspaper clippings, right? That way, at the end of the movie, when you see his face, you go, oh, it's Grindelwald. You don't need Tina or whoever to yell, it's Grindelwald. Because... And it's more of a twist because you're not confused. But the, but the minute you cast Johnny Depp, right, and he's in the newspaper at the beginning and you see the face and it's clearly Johnny Depp, you go, oh, crap, he's going to appear in this movie somewhere. And then you're looking for him, right? So you might figure out early that Colin uh, Farrell is, 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 is Grindelwald, right? Because you're, you're, you don't cast Johnny Depp in a movie and put him in 10 seconds of footage in the front of a newspaper. You only do that if the character is appearing, right, in the movie. You just wouldn't otherwise. So by casting someone big as Johnny Depp, they kind of fucked up their own surprise because then they weren't able to actually make the reveal about who it is, but as, rather it became about who the actor is. And that is where they went wrong, I think. That's the wrong character. To, if you're going to do some American stunt casting, do that for the large, for the role that's more prominent in the movie. Like, so you yeah, do do like a Mads Mikkelsen and you have Mads Mikkelsen's face be... Because uh, Mads Mikkelsen wasn't even that big of a... He was even less of a name, I think, when this came out um, than he is now. So, so you get Mads Mikkelsen in, he, he's he's thing, and then you cast your Johnny Depp in the Colin Farrell role as Graves, you know. Yeah, but you even even if you show Depp's... I, I still think the film functioning, whilst you are correct from an outside point of view, you go, well, you're not just going to get Johnny Depp for that um, for that sort of profit frame. You could think he's going to appear at the end or he'll be in a post credit scene. I, I still think that protects the twist better than making it about the actor and therefore losing the twist completely because the audience is surprised and you have to do that ham-fisted Grindelwald. Um, so I still think even showing Depp's face in the article and, importantly, embedding more references to Grindelwald throughout the movie um, mm-hmm. would would protect that twist better than the execution of than the current execution of the twist. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think you're right. I think you're right. I think you're what right. are your what are your what are your other notes, Dan? Yeah, what, sorry, um, we we got really fixed I, I think on that last part, didn't we? Sorry, um, uh, no, it's all good. I think we've naturally covered everything I had, so I'm just I'm curious. Yeah, if yeah. You've let's, got let's, any let's, others. let's do some stuff. So um, I like his arrival to the city. It's fun, but I will say, if you've got a case like that that can have beast soul in it and they can sometimes escape, maybe just leave it on Muggle mode all the time. Well, I want to know is what happens when he tries to pick something. If he'd have reached out and tried to pick up a shirt or whatever. Would he have been able to pick up a shirt, or was that like a like a visual a visual filter? Yeah, I couldn't tell if it was like a it's like a trick case where when you switch that on, like a shelf slides out from a magical extra space into that with physical stuff in it, and then maybe his maybe his clothes are actually in there. Maybe that is his stuff, or is it just like it tricks you visually? I couldn't tell, but either way, you know, fine, I guess. Um, I hate 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 the trope of the cases getting switched. Oh, the two people have the same looking bag and it's been switched. Um, I hate it. I've always hated it. It never works. It's always dumb. It, it, the odds of two people having the exact same bag and then being in the exact same spot and then one picks up the wrong one. It's fucking stupid. It's in so many movies. It's always contrived. It never functions and I hate it. It's in a sitcom I watched recently and I hated it there too. I hate it. What? What I didn't like about it was at first I was like quite impressed that they didn't do that. Right. You think it's gonna you think it's gonna happen at the bank in the bank and it doesn't. Well you and think I it might like, happen oh, outside good. even. There's a point when they bump into each other yeah. outside and I and you think it's gonna happen there and it doesn't. And I was like, Oh, good for you, and movie. Was, Some restraint. Yeah. I was literally like, Well done, movie, and then it happens and it's like, Oh no, okay, you were just saving it. Never mind. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we haven't talked too much about the bank sequence. I think the bank sequence is fine. I like the joke at the end that they're just like, you know, there's a point where they're just in the bottom of the vault and he's just tipping the niffler upside down and all the jewels are falling out and that just seems to... Jewels seem to fall out of it forever. That's fun. But again, it's a sequence that makes Newt look utterly useless. You know, um, magic done in front of muggles, like... The, 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 the case like is, is obviously broken it's like fix it dude for all this stuff and also like so much of the for so much of this movie's plot to function Newt has to be inept and that means your plot's not right choose a different plot <laughs> you know uh, you know what I thought would have been quite fun the mm-hmm. whole movie the bank guys after Jacob 
And you're like, oh, fucking hell. Like, he really thinks he robbed him. He's after him. And then the bank guy's like, I tried that donut, man. I loved it. The money's yours. <laughs> Actually, that's... <laughs> just raised another good point the bank guy comes down is like kowalski you're robbing us and then new um Petru- does a petrificus totalis which is another neat little like use of an you know something a bit different from an expelliarmus or that weird gun blast they often use the guy goes down all rigid and then they um apparate out of there cool um yeah what do so what, what when kowalski goes back in a week later with his silver the guy's like yeah you tried to rob us last week i saw that but don't worry about it or did, did the ministry erase that guy's memory afterwards what happened there yeah, I, I i assume tina arranges a ministry like okay. memory wipe or whatever all right fine not in the movie but maybe it should be <laughs> Um, I did enjoy seeing uh, no, the magic, equal, the yeah, but equally, co- e- e- okay. equally him going back to the guy for the loan isn't in the movie either, so I don't think it matters that much. No, you're right. No, it's not a big deal. Just a small thing. Uh, magical Congress of the US. I think it's cool. I like their headquarters, except for all the weird murder, the murder, the murder chair thing that I just, I, I don't even have a criticism of it. I just don't understand it. I don't know what's happening in that scene. I don't understand the stakes. I don't know what they're avoiding. I don't know why they're seeing memories of each other. I, I Nothing about that scene makes sense to my brain. And I don't know if they explain it and I missed it or what, but yeah, don't get it. Um, at no point does anyone tell Jacob that there are witches and wizards. Jacob never gets that information specifically spelled out to him. He just sort of falls into the magical world and runs with it. And I can't decide if that's an awesome thing or a terrible thing. Oh, yeah. There's never a moment where he's like, what the hell is going on? And Newt's like, look, the secret wizard society that's underneath the real world. We all can do magic. You know, Sorry about that. You know what the problem there is? The, the defined lines of how affected by the bite Jacob is are really right. blurred. Yeah, like he's he's as affected as the particular scene or joke needs him to be affected because mm-hmm. one of the reasons they never sit down and go these are witches and wizards is because he's all like spacey and all mm-hmm. you know overwhelmed by the venom and that's like it, that's the scenario in which he um first sees magic so you kind of go oh well it's being written off cuz you know presumably when he gets well they can oblivion whatever um, so yeah, I'm not trying to fan explain it. I think you maybe could argue that he sees it all. And that what I think what it needs is once he snaps back to consciousness, when he gets cured, he should be like, wait, all of this is real. <laughs> like, but that would slow the scenes down, I guess. So I think that's the problem because mm-hmm. of the circumstances Jacob's in. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, do we think... So we introduce like we have them all sit around. They have a, they have the, you know there's a bit where they all have a meal. You know remember, like where they where they're like oh we got to look after Jacob because he's like he's he's been sick and we don't again as you just said we don't have like the def- the, de- de- the definition of what's like going on with him there in that scene. So it's like really unclear. Um, do you, so do you think in that scene like that's around the table that's where they have that conversation? Do you think that's that's where we could fix that? It just have that conversation focused that way because I don't even what do they even actually do in that scene in terms of establishing character or story? What are they talking about around that that dinner table? I don't even remember now. Just strudel. <laughs> I, don't, I can't remember. Uh, a lot of it's strudel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like w- which pie do you do? You want a pie or a strudel? You like strudel, don't you? Like, um, they talk about the fact that she's reading memories and stuff, like me reading minds. Oh, so that, stuff, that's what they. Yeah, but they already established at that point that she's a. That she's a that they established in the, in the scene where they first meet Queenie, where she's half dressed, that she's legitimate. Then she's like, "You're gonna stay for dinner because obviously we've got to look after this, you know, doofus." And then they sit around no, and, I have thought a, they stab- and have a meal. I think. I think they establish it just after because there's that no, quite good joke I've got where it she's. Me. Oh, it's just there's that quite good joke where she says, um, "Don't worry, honey." Well, it's a little bit after than after she's dressed at least because there's that great joke where she says, "Don't worry, a lot of people, a lot of people think what you thought when you when they first see me." Yeah. So that's that's the scene that goes before the meal. I'm talking about the scene that follows. So so basically, they go in. They ha- she's half dressed. She puts her clothes on. And they establish she's legitimate. Yeah. Then we have that joke. She goes over to a, at this point still dumbfounded Jacob and makes that that joke. And then we cut. It sort of it doesn't jump a huge amount forward, but it jumps a little bit forward. And Newt's trying to leave, and they're like, you know, where are you going? You got to you got you know we're not going to poison you. Stay for stay. We're going to eat. You know, and that's when they talk about the strudel thing. Um, 
and then we get then we get a scene where they're all sat around, and then they they all sat around the table eating, mm-hmm. and that's like. But I'm just thinking that's the time to maybe establish that. Then. Maybe that's the scene where we have that like do something with with clarifying what's going on with Jacob. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. He's very, he's I, very, I don't, he's I, very, that, that dialogue goes on for a while. I just don't remember it doing anything. I think they, he's very spaced out watching the strudel form, which even then is also a way we've never seen magic used where it like, like cooks it instantly and like put binds the ingredients. Oh, that's, yeah, stuff. that's a good so visual. He, so it might be, maybe you could argue the visuals are n- enough for a, a sign of, by the way, it's magic, Jacob. <laughs> but. Right. Oh, actually, tell you what. What we have? Oh, it's broken up with a scene, with a different scene. That's why. They 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 sit. He, she tells him to sit down. That they're not going to poison him, and then we cut to Greaves talking to Credence. That's 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 how they break it up, and then we go back to having right. dinner. Right. Let's but do. like I say, I think part of the problem with um, putting any exposition to Jacob there is they can't decide whether he's you know poisoned, whether he's whether his ass is about to explode, like because that's one of the symptoms and all that stuff. So. Yeah, yeah, but I, I guess then, I guess, cause then, yeah, because then they, it's weird because then they have like the whole yeah. So what they talk about around the dinner table, I finally found the actual dialogue is just that, that that Queenie's kind of lightly flirting with Jacob, and then they go to bed, mm. and then we have which the whole we funny. got brought Coco thing, which is funny because the the Coco thing is funny, but uh, yeah, it's not. It is a bit odd. Like surely. Surely Newt had a place to stay. Well, I suppose he's. She's saying that they've got to do it, do it together. But yeah, yeah, it's mm. it's flimsy. Anyway. Yeah, it is. Anyway, I'm um, sorry we got very distracted there. Um, the movie. Yeah, I, I did write down that the movie has just no thrust at all. It's just very muddled, and it, it, they they always kind of each scene they kind of want something, but it's never really overall clear what the characters' general overall motivations are. It's very unsatisfying, and the reason that is is I think is because a lot of the characters are being vague on purpose about what they're up to because a lot of them have. You know, like particularly with like Greaves, we don't know what he wants because we're not supposed to yet because we don't have the reveal of Griddlewall. And I think it's one of those things where the mysteries actually hurt this movie more than help it. You know, uh, Newt's being evasive about his past. You know, about the 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 girl that he couldn't save from the Obscurus. Like they're all being evasive about stuff. And I think maybe just maybe don't worry too much about having mysteries that develop across the movie and just let the characters say the things that they think and feel, and then we can be a bit more invested in what's happening around them and why they're choosing the things they're choosing. Yeah, um, yeah I'd agree. So uh, the American government think Newt is there to expose the magical world as an agent of Grindelwald. Oh, no, they do do that. They do... Co- yeah, okay. That, that's, that's an interesting scene. They interview, they interview Newt, and they, they're saying they think he's there to expose the magical world on behalf of Grindelwald. So we do do a bit of setting up a Grindelwald in the middle uh, of the movie. Yeah. Yeah, I'd forgotten that. Yeah, you're right. Still doesn't work, but you know, still not enough no. for whatever reason. But yeah. Um. Oh, uh, door is magically locked. Can't be opened with a Lohamora, but um, it can be kicked open extremely easily by Jacob. Is is this supposed to be <laughs> oh, wizard? Yeah. Is this supposed to be? Wi- wi- is this a sign of wizard arrogance again? They've you know they put a magical lock on the door. Uh, not assuming that anyone will actually go for the muggle route of giving it a kick. Um, but, I mean, I, I, if I was a wizard and I wanted to get in your office, mate, and then Aloha Mora doesn't work, I'm giving it a kick. Just saying. I would make it, love make that. The, as make, an make the door kick proof. If you're making it Aloha Mora proof, make it kick proof. That's a great explanation, though. I do love that as an explanation for it. Well, just the arrogance of, like, assuming that yeah. they only try to do it in a magical way. And they did. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um,. Oh, <laughs> just another really bad line of dialogue. Because <laughs> the whole movie, the way they try to trick you into thinking Credence isn't the Obscurus is they keep being like, no, no, the Obscurus can't be anyone under 10. No no one under 10. No, sorry, no one over 10. I, should, I, I said that wrong. No one over 10. 10 is the limit. They, they're they dead by 10 if they're an Obscurus. No one over 10. And then it's like it's revealed to be... Um, <laughs> it's revealed to be Credence. <laughs> Tina asks Newt, and he replies, I wrote this down word for word, his power must be so strong he somehow managed to survive. Good work, movie. Very specific. <laughs> so good. That's like the worst writing. It's, it's like she knew she had to answer the question but didn't have an answer, so instead she has Newt vaguely guess. At, he's just strong, I guess. He yeah. somehow managed to survive. 
<laughs> Everyone uh... thinks that line from Rise of Skywalker, somehow Emperor Palpatine survived, is bad. But hey, here we go. Here's the forebearer for, for of that line. His power must be so strong, he somehow managed to survive. Newt Scamander. <laughs> Yeah, it's very flimsy, especially when there's so, so much about the character is uh, is related to sort of abuse and related to the, the difficulties he's had, his relationship with his mother. I'm sure you could have created an explanation of, uh, you know, his his mother made him feel not not anything anyway. Or do you know what I mean? Like, I'm right. sure there's a, a much deeper interesting character explanation you could have created other than that yeah. ah, is really strong yeah yep 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 uh so uh, so, so for, 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 for example f- so for for example uh with everyone else it was about childhood ending but he never had a childhood or something like do you oh, know what i mean good. something yeah, yeah. Fine. like that i yeah. and i and i and it's worth noting i for those of you who are screaming at the right now I know there's a potential good fan explanation that comes in the next movie, but we're, the, the next movie isn't here yet, and I, you know, uh, we have to go on what this movie presents. Mm. So you know, let's you know, we're gonna, we, we're not gonna so... use that. We'll talk about that next week, basically. I mean, there's a I thing in the so... air that's not, yeah, go on. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, and and I know what that thing is as well. Uh, I've had that spoiled for me, but yeah, I, you can't I not so... because everyone was talking about it when this came out. <laughs> I'm so shocked that between out. that, between that, and every it, like, it, it, I mean, it feels like if if him coming back was the plan all along, I was so bamboozled to find this movie didn't have a post credit sequence which featured him coming back. Yeah, I was I, like, I, oh, I, I read somewhere there's like weird. a shot where it looks like maybe a bit of black smoke slips away, but I I couldn't find it. I looked through the movie and tried to find. I couldn't find a shot like that. So, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, anyway um, let's uh, let's trim it up. I'm gonna give you some trivia. So let's do it. Um, in an interview with Vulture, Alfonso Curon, director of Prisoner of Azkaban, uh, expressed interest in directing this film. He said Azkaban was fun. Um, to make and when I did it I was invited to do the next one but I didn't want to overstay my welcome because it was such an experience but wow uh, but now sorry wh- why not um, I do stuff that I want to but it's a JK thing they haven't called me yet they, <laughs> they haven't decided to invite me um, looking at forward at least to see because nobody's invited me <laughs> so it sounded like Kiran really wanted to do it but no one picked up the phone <laughs> it's weird Coron would have been a fucking fascinating choice for this yeah, movie. I agree. I would have enjoyed seeing that. Then again, we have uh, said basically that the visuals of this and the movie making in this is is, yeah. is pretty good. Yeah, I don't yeah. think we'd have I don't no. think we'd have had wand guns though, and that would have been nice. But anyway, yeah. moving on. Uh, Eddie Redmayne was apparently the only choice for this lead role, according to J.K. Rowling. He didn't even have to audition, um, and he took part in the, he did take part in the casting process, but only to uh, read with other actors for the rest of the roles. Uh, prior to filming, Eddie Redmayne was provided with a very detailed backstory for Newt's Commander, which J.K. Rowling revealed exclusively to him, so he knows all of the Eddie Redmayne, sorry, the Newt's Commander-based secrets. So there you go. Super, super, super quick, because we've not actually discussed it. Uh, I I think he's good in the role. Like, you, you know, you want to argue about the ineptitude on the page, uh, fine, but his performance is, I think, strong it's a bit you know in, in doing some of the eddie redmade shtick that he does in other films but you know maybe that's what makes him a good choice for the role i, I do think he plays the part well mm. i'm just so charmingly befuddled yeah 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 mm. he's doing that thing fine i guess if that's what you want from the character then he's doing it you know he's bumbling through sort of like oh, i'm so sorry ever so sorry I'm, so, I'm just so british you know he's doing that that's fine it works I, look if the character had been given more i'm sure he'd have been able to give more um, so I'm not criticizing his performance, but I, like, I, you know, he doesn't have much to work with. So it's like, yeah, I guess he does the things he's been asked to do with the script. Well, but nothing special because he's not given the opportunity to do anything special. He de- he delivers the lines he's given with the, with the, with, with, with skill. That's the best I can say for it. But it's again, you know, it's like asking you Hussein Bolt to like do a run, but like, it's like, it, it, he, he he gets he can he, you know he gets more time to do it than usual and then he does it and you're still impressed it's like well he can do that faster you know <laughs> like you know it's you know he's he's capable of more the move script doesn't give him more so it's hard to be impressed by what i see here but yeah no he's he's functional in the role so yeah 
Um, he's admitted that he uh, uh, that he didn't do well to audi- when he auditioned for the role of Kylo Ren in Star Wars: Force Awakens, and that's what actually freed him up to do this. Um, mm. He was he wasn't aware at the time he was the only choice from the studio's perspective for the role, but um, he was it was it worked, he he kind of felt it was a bit serendipitous because if he'd if he'd gotten the role of Kylo Ren, he would have uh, not been available to do this. So there you go. Um, alternate you go. casting, and this one's well, I don't know what I say about this. Um, we nearly had Michael Sarah playing the role of Jacob. <laughs> You, you know, I'm going to go ahead and say it. I don't mean to be a dick. I don't think that would have been as good. <laughs> no, uh, Michael Sarah's Jacob would have been terrible. Um, thankfully, he'd just been cast in Lego Batman movie. So they couldn't have him, which is a relief. Um, they also considered Josh Gad, Steve uh, Zissis, and Zach Perlman. Um, all, I think inferior choices and you know what I, I i like josh gad well enough i like michael sarah well enough for the things that they do that would have been pretty bad on all counts mm. yeah. yeah no it's it's very hard to imagine anyone but dan in the role but yeah, uh Fogelman. yeah oh, is it F- fogel fogel yeah. it's fogel i always get it fogel, i always, always, always want to say fogelman because there's the guy that did the this is us he's called like dan fogelman isn't he yeah, I think it's Fogler, but I think both of us have called him Fogelman in this podcast. So. I, I reckon that's true. Yeah. So Dan Fogler is Jacob, and then Dan Fogelman, yeah, is the American TV producer creator, I believe, of This Is Us. So yeah, that's it's, uh, we're big fans of This Is Us. It's an easy mix up for us to make. Um, other options for the role of Queenie were Sasha Ronan. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Apologies. Uh, Dakota Fanning, Kristen Stewart, and Lily Simmons. Uh, I think some of those would have been fine, but I, I like who we got. I think they actually got the casting just right on this one. Yeah, yeah, I think she was great. Yeah. Um, alternate options for Tina were uh, Kate Upton and Elizabeth Debicki. Um, Kate Upton would have been dreadful, and Elizabeth Debicki would have probably been quite good. Um, I like the actress that plays Tina in this movie. I think she's, she's, she's good, but... Um, you know, I, 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 Elizabeth Debicki is obviously a wonderful actress, also, and I'm sure we're doing a good job. So that was, yeah. that is what it is. Yeah. Um. So th- I, I, we already, t- I already covered this slightly, but Frank the Thunderbird is a uh, is one of the four Ilvermorny School of Witchcraft and Wizardy houses, as detailed in Pottermore. I, I put that in the truth because there wasn't a lot of actual filmmaking truth this week. The truth was mostly. If supplemental information from Pottermore that I don't think should be covered in truth because quite frankly um, if it's not in the movie it's not I'm not talking about it. it's, it's truth for the movie well there you go it's true Fair enough. unless it, re- it completely changes our thoughts on the movie but even then put it in the movie if there's, if there's a part of the movie that's fixed by supplemental information that's on Pottermore go fuck yourself JK that's what I say to that um um, I do, I do, you know, it's not necessarily that she's saying that, though, isn't it? Isn't often a lot of those truth notes like fans putting stuff together? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. But they're t- if they're taking stuff, so what I'm saying is, if there's if there's something in this movie that didn't make sense, and there's an article or a thing that was probably written or curated by J.K. on Pottermore that makes it make more sense, I say fuck you to that because if she know if she knows that context, it should be in the movie. Mm. And I think I don't think that's too much to ask. Fair enough. Um, in terms of where I'm seeing the trivia built up, yeah, I do. I start with the IMDb trivia and then go from there. And the IMDb trivia is often full of all sorts of irrelevant shite. Um, it is po- there are still a couple in here though that are kind of in that realm, but just I do think like are worth mentioning. We'll come with that in a second. But um, it's possible that house elves may be free in America based on this movie because some elves are seen wearing regular clothes and being openly insolent towards humans without fear of reprisal. It's possible based on the film. That it's just the British wizarding world that seems to have enslaved house elves until their owners give them proper clothes and forbidden and has forbidden them to use wands. Although um, obviously we know that they can't, they can perform magic without them. Uh, yeah, we see. I think we see a house elf with a wand in this movie or a goblin. Maybe it's whoever whoever in the in the American Congress takes them up in the lift seems to be holding a wand. Um, I noted that at the time. Yeah, right. I thought that was an interesting choice. Um, mm, definitely. Lita Lestrange. Um, 
who who will become more relevant is likely related to Rodolphus Lestrange, who is the husband of Bellatrix. So possibly brother or father or I don't know, it wouldn't be father, like nephew or something. It's it's hard to say exactly, but um, she's probably related to Rodolphus. That's where she gets that Lestrange name from. We will learn more about Lita Lestrange in a later movie. So we go we'll go from there. I assumed so. Mm-hmm. Um. So. Uh, this is a oh, I love this one Faye Hammond who's the hair designer for this film believed that Newt would often need to groom himself on ships as he travelled and other less ideal circumstances so she handed a bewildered Eddie Redmayne a pair of rusty kitchen scissors and instructed him to go into the nearby closet and go at his wig as a result the wig for the movie <laughs> That's great. is indeed the wig cut by Eddie Redmayne in the dark I really like that yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, I like that. And I, you know what? I think I think that hairstyle's pretty. I think it's pretty good. It suits him. It suits the character. I think that's good. Yeah, I've you know I've tried to pull off similar many a time, yeah. and I've never pulled it off as well. <laughs> yeah, it looks good. It looks good. I think. Uh, I reckon he went in butchered it, and then she gave him like a one that she'd done separately. <laughs> Just, I didn't tell him. Yeah, look how great you cut it, Eddie. <laughs> this looks great. <laughs> anyway, um, Newt is seen at the end of the movie wearing a uh, grey and yellow scarf. This is a little nod to um, Newt having been a uh, Hufflepuff. Uh, Newt was a... Is yes, more... yeah, I spotted that. Sorry? Uh, that that one I spotted. I was quite pleased with myself. Yes. I was like, oh, Hufflepuff. Yes. I, I cl- Yeah, I was, I was also... I did another one. I, it's very, it's very often we, we don't spot these until someone tells them, but that's... Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it was good. I saw it and I was like, I wonder if people got excited about that. And then I read the trivia and was like, they did. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that look, makes sense. Hufflepuff has very few things to in that. Uh, as referenced in that Mitchell and Webb sketch, where they're trying to talk about the things that are good about Hufflepuff, and it's they go, "Last year, one of us died." That's interesting, I suppose. <laughs> referring to Cedric Diggory, <laughs> Hufflepuff don't have a lot to celebrate. Uh, so yeah, I guess having Newt's commander be one of them is a good thing. <laughs> yeah. So, so apparently there was a scene that was filmed. It's never been put on any version of DVD or Blu-ray or box set, but apparently it was filmed, but removed from the movie, of a shirtless Newt Scamander that was designed to show off that he had actually collected a great deal of scars on his body during his work with dangerous animals. Um, I'm just going to assume that's not just cuts and stuff, but like claw marks, but also like, you know, burns and other sorts of gnarled bits. Um, apparently, Eddie Redmayne had worked out a huge amount to get himself into shape before filming this movie, knowing that scene was in the script and that he'd have to film it. And then it was cut from the film and has never been seen since. So, <laughs> sorry, Eddie. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. sorry, Eddie. Uh, Justice for Eddie. <laughs> but, but thank, yeah, thanks for all your efforts. And uh, it, sounds, it does sound like a good scene, like a good visual way of, like it's a cool idea. So yeah, yeah, especially if they put that in contrast with him saying how not dangerous the animals are, I think that will be an interesting conflict for the character. Like you say that, but you look like mm. you've had a bit of a rough go around. So I don't know. I thought that might have been interesting. Mm. It's a shame it didn't make it in the movie. Um, during the filming of the Harry Potter movies, Daniel Radcliffe went through 160 pairs of glasses. Isn't that interesting, Chris? It's I'm on the edge of my seat, mate. Mm. Uh, J.K. Rowling confirmed on her Twitter account on June the fourth, two thousand and fifteen, that Tina is short for Porpentina. Um, in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, the comic relief novel we referred to earlier, there's a small about the author section at the back, and Newt Scamander is noted as now living in Dorset with his wife, Porpentina, and their pet Kneezels, Hoppy, Millie, and Mauler. Uh, they're, they're a good couple. I'd like, to, I'd like to see them get together. I suspect the box office figures means I won't. <laughs> I suspect the actress playing Tina's vocal choice to not um, support J.K. Rowling's turfy views might mean she's in about two seconds of the third movie, Chris, is what I think. <clears throat> oh, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hmm. Isn't it funny? It just it must be a coincidence. She's, she's, you know, she said, you know, trans women are women. She, she, does, she doesn't agree with J.K.'s political views. And now the movie that J.K.'s writing, she's only got a tiny role. I think it's a coincidence. It's a coincidence. I, I, I'm not, I, you know, I'm not implying anything, Chris. Not implying anything. JK was always going to minimise that character's role in the third movie. It was always the plan. Nothing to do with the actress. <laughs> Coincidences happen, Dan. I mean, yeah. it's a coincidence that the that the new the new um, the new strike book features a plot eerily <laughs> similar to to real life. And similar because that mean. was that was that that was actually written before, mm. and presumably there was no time to change it. 
Um, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, these things are just strange. Yeah, it's weird. Anyway, um, if anyone doesn't know about that, by the way, you should look up. There's articles people have written. Basically, she's the new Cormoran Strike book is an author that was like mistreated by the internet, and it's very much like it just it reads weird. <laughs> it reads it reads like everyone's being mean to me, and I don't know why. Um, it's really interesting. <laughs> look it up if you haven't. It's fucking hilarious. Anyway, um, if you look closely at the scene where Newt is showing Jacob all of the fantastic beasts he's collected for the first time, you can see a Grindelow in a bubble of water. These creatures are obviously prominently featured in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire as part of the Triwizard Tournament's underwater task. Additionally, in the books, Professor Lupin actually has one in his office while he's teaching at Hogwarts. And in the books, they kind of cover it that that's the reason Harry knows how to deal with the Grindelows in Goblet of Fire. Um, and then obviously the Grindel is referenced again actually, sorry, in, in Deathly Hallows because of course that's the question that um, Lupin asks Harry what was in my office the first time we spoke and the answer was of course the Grindel so the Grindel in this movie, that's nice little, mm. little detail uh, Frank the Giant nice they've, added, nice they've added some context to that uh, scene in the movies yes <laughs> finally <laughs> Um, still what still winds me up just fucking edit it so it's something the movies have covered you yeah carry on um the thunderbirds are actually um based off the mythical bird um in native american folklore um they're supposed to uh create and are summoned by lightning which explains why frank is like got a storm-based powers weather-based powers Mm. i think that's nice um Credence presumably died it when his obscurest form was destroyed in, by the auras at the end of this movie. However, according to David Yates, they shot a scene in which Credence was still alive in the aftermath, but then deleted it. Because the other filmmakers had yet to decide on the direction the character was going to appear on in the sequels. So, Chris, I've been saving this because we talked a bit about Credence. It sounds to me like they just didn't know what they were going to do with Credence. Yeah, yeah, completely. Mm-hmm. Um, although apparently in the finished film, Newt sees a small black thing escape during the aftermath, suggesting Oculus isn't complete. The, the obscure, sorry, isn't is it complete? Uh, it, sorry, to go back to that, I don't. You were sort of like, mm-hmm, is there a is there theories like uh, it was to do with Ezra Miller or something? Or no, no, no. They just literally do, like it's cl- what's clear here is that that, that basically they writing wise, J.K. hadn't decided if she was using him in the next movie. Right, yeah, yeah. So they didn't want to show for sure if he was alive or dead because they wanted to leave it open. But what they've done there by accident is just made it look like he's dead. They didn't want to confirm yeah, outright you know that he was still alive. Uh, because then yeah, in the next movie, to, if you you're gonna, expect to see him. If you're going to essentially explode a character, I'm sorry, you need to make that decision before this movie comes out Correct. and either put that scene in or kill him. <laughs> Correct. Um, however, in the finished film, Newt sees a small black thing escape during the aftermath, suggesting the Obscurus isn't completely gone. Now, I looked for this shot. I could not find it. Couldn't couldn't find it. Sorry. Don't know if it's there. Maybe it is. Maybe I'm blind. I looked, flicked through the movie when I read that trivia. Could not locate the moment in question. But in 2018, Ezra Miller confirmed um, that they would be returning as Credence in the sequel. So that was like a year or two after this came out. Um, he sort of was like, yeah, I'm back in the next one. So we knew before even that one came out that he was back. So, uh, final bit of trivia before we just we, we do some rankings, which I think this is actually the easiest ranking I've done so far, Chris. Truthfully, we'll talk about that in a second. But before we do that, it's time for cars exist. It's a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking about the ranking. Oh, I was thinking about the ranking because I I've got the opposite problem. I'm struggling with it, but yeah. So I was thinking about that. Sorry, I found fa- I, I found this so easy to rank, but maybe that's just me. Um. Where are we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've just had a glance. That's, that's right. Um, most of the background cars in this movie are various models um, of Ford, the, the Model T specifically, but from different years. So the earliest one is the 1917 Ford Model T, and the latest one is a 1927 Ford Model T, which I think might be anachronistic. I forget the exact year the movie is set. Um, but... Mostly, even though they're mostly old Model T Fords, because I think they're just very visually of the era. I think they're a very iconic look. You just look at it and you go, yeah, it's the 20s. You know what I mean? It's one of them sort of things. But a few other cars can be spotted in the movie, including a 1926 Buick Standard 6, a 1927 Erskine... Erskine? 
Model 50 and a Dodge Brothers sedan, which has an unknown year. Like, no one can identify exactly what year that one is from. So there you go. That's Cars Exist, Chris. No. No. So um, I'll give you my quick, my quick ranking, Chris, because for me, right now, the Harry Potter films are very clearly divided in two, right? The, the, the two Columbus ones, Azkaban and Order of the Phoenix, are clearly the top four, right? Yeah. And I really despised, you know, Gobbler, Afterblood Prince, and Deathly Hallows Part 1 and 2, right? Those are both in my bottom half. And, and you know, we, t- we talked about the order a few times. I'll, I'll re clarify my full order in a bit, but those that's, that's how it is. This slot's right in the middle for me between those two because it's nowhere near as good as either of the Columbus films or Gobbler. No, sorry, not Gobbler. Uh, Phoenix or Azkaban, the Curon one. But it's nowhere near as bad as those David Yates ones <laughs> from the towards the end of the run. So it just slips nicely in the middle for me. So my full order at present, worst one, eight, then it goes seven, four, six, then this one, nine, one, three, five, two. Very easy for me. The reason I'm struggling a bit more mm-hmm. is because it's that it's that thing I always think of, overthink of. It's favourite, not best. And a bad Harry Potter movie, still a Harry Potter movie. I think I'd still be more likely to turn to one of the badder Harry Potter movies to see, you know, Robbie Coltrane nail it as Hagrid and to, you know, get some get some fun on brooms than I would this, which is why I struggle. Because the reason I struggle is because that's one side and the other side is going, but it is so clearly a better movie yeah. than that lower half. Honestly, I'd rather watch um, this than Gobbler or Half-Blood Prince or either of the two final ones. I'd definitely, I'd definitely rather watch it than Half-Blood Prince. That's a given. Okay, um, so Half-Blood Prince was sick. So that means you, you've at least got it Second to last, because <laughs> you've put that last so far. Half Blood no, Prince, ha- Half Blood Prince, yeah, Half Blood Prince is last for me, yeah. Um, so that, well, let's well, let's work. On, let's help. I'll help you out. Well, let's work it up. So you'd rather watch it than Half Blood Prince. What about Deathly Hallows Part Two? Yeah, which is your next one up? Oh, I still internally am debating between Part One and Part Two, but um, well, let's well, we lump those together. Part One and Part Two are your next two. Would you rather watch those than this? Yeah, I, I think it slots in between those. I think I would choose Goblet over over this, um, but I would put this below Goblet. No, Goblet is such a fucking mess. No, I'm putting it in the same position as you, smack bang in the middle between my crappier half and in and when it gets good. Yep, I think that's exactly yeah. You, we, we've got it in the same position. It's just, it, you know, I can't possibly say I would rather watch Goblet, Half Blood Prince, or the two Deathly Hallows films more than this one. But absolutely, I'd rather watch the Columbus ones. Azkaban or Phoenix more than this one, so yeah, I thought that was yeah, I, that was sure. very simple for me. I, I'm, I, it's interesting that you came. To the, I, not interesting. I think it's it's probably sensible you came to the same conclusion. It's probably what I'd say. It's sense, it, it makes sense that we came to the same conclusion on that because the, when yeah, when I go through because... that list, minus the Fantastic Beast films, when we just have the Harry Potter ones right on my list, there is such a gulf between if you go eight, seven, four, six. Then one, mm. the gap between the quality on my list of Half Blood Prince and Philosopher's Stone is mind melting. <laughs> that is yeah, such same, a big same, window for same. these movies to slot into. Same for me between Philosophers and um, my next one would be Chamber uh, Goblet. Oh, sorry, your oh, next sorry, one, next ja- one no, down. So, sorry, next so, one down. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, sorry. That yeah, I've got, I've got chamber above Philosopher's mm-hmm. Stone, haven't I? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I went, so, I went up, yeah, but so, you went down. Yeah, I understood. Yeah, yeah. So same for me. The 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 gulf between Philosophers and Goblet is is huge. Yeah, and so it makes perfect sense that you could slot any movie of a medium quality in there. All right. Well, there you yeah, go, everyone. Yeah, we, we, we did it. There we go. Um, it's been a, it's been a good time. It's a, you know, it's a, just a little over two hours, a little longer than I was hoping. But you know, it's these it's, it's, it's Harry Potter in it. We're obviously very passionate about the show. Um, but you can get us all the usual places if you want to get next week's episode now, while we sit down and talk about uh, crimes of Grindelwald, uh, crimes of Wizard Hitler. You can go 
check that out on the Patreon, patreon.com slash nothing but static, uh, where you can give as little as $1 a month and get access to that episode a week early, as well as other potential. I, I, oh, man, have I had an idea, Chris, that you're going to like for a quick bonus podcast we can do that's 10 minutes long? To, to some extra content. I'm going to tease it here. I'm going to tease it here. Um, that maybe one day if we do a shorter episode, once we're doing Cora again, maybe we can stick one of these at the end. Just a, okay, just a little, nice. just a little odd one off. We just do it every now and then. We can fit it in. Ten minutes long. Oh, I think you're gonna love it. I think you're gonna be very excited. Um, yeah, so we we may have some exclusive content on the Patreon soon. But in the meantime, for now, you get episodes of this and Analyzing Avatar, which we'll soon be tackling Cora on a week early over on the Patreon. You can support us in other ways by liking and subscribing and all that on all the various platforms. You can leave comments on YouTube if you've got thoughts on any of this or or you can hit us on twitter i'm at dan doolan chris is at c billingham we also have at nothing but static without the g if you want to contact us uh that way but if uh, what you've got to say can't be contained into a tweet too many characters too many harry potter based thoughts you can always send us it at mail at nothing but static to get it us that way so that is everything um you know thank you all for listening this has been a hell of a undertaking i don't think either of us realized yep. the toll it would take on our minds <laughs> Well, we... No, or how much it would engulf our thoughts and minds. I mean, it doesn't help that I've chosen to read the books alongside, but there we go. Yeah, that's, yeah, um... <laughs> that may, may have been an error. I tell you what, though, this has forced me to quickly log back into my uh, Pottermore, Chris, to double check w- w- um, what uh, what my, my wand was. I was curious, because I remembered I had a Dolphin Patronus mm. and I was sorted into Hufflepuff. I double checked. For anyone wondering, it's a laurel wood wand with a unicorn core. Uh, 11 and uh, three quarter inches. Slightly springy. I never, I never did the Pottermore thing. I'm, I, I have, been, I have thought maybe I should go in and and see see what house I am. My memory of it is is that when you get in there, it's one of the first things you do. So you wouldn't have to like, you know, and it's free. I don't think you know. You, yeah, yeah. And then you can get you get assigned a wand and a Patronus. You can do both those pretty quickly. The, the I remember the Patronus one being a pretty interesting quiz because it asks really seemingly innocuous questions and then decides your Patronus. And I remember thinking, there's some weird. Some weird shit going on here, like in terms of how this is working this out. I don't know what uh, JK's given them some long expl- an explanation of what kind of person you might be if you answer it this way or this way, and the people at the website have just like pumped it all into some algorithm. It's just, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. See, it is interesting. I, see that 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 puts that puts me off it. I don't I don't want to be given a Patronus when I I so clearly know what my Patronus is. What's yours? A teddy bear. Ah, uh, yes. Well, I don't think a teddy bear can be a Patronus, yeah. Chris. Can in my world, Dan. I won't hear anything. I won't hear anything. But no. well, but do you, you can at least find out what house you're in, and then what your wand is, <laughs> and what my what my official Patronus is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I got. I, got, I was quite happy with Dolphin. I thought Dolphin was pretty good. Yeah, Dolphin's good. Yeah, yeah. Dolphin's mm. nice. I had someone on on Twitter yeah. was saying they got a Boston Terrier, and I was just like, isn't it weird that we like we'll go specific on breed of dog instead of just saying dog. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like every other one, it's like you're a bird, you're you're a dolphin, you're you're yeah. a snake, you're you know. It's a, oh, they got they must go specific on birds, surely. It can't just be ah, yeah, it's a bird. I don't, it's a good question. I don't know which animals do we bother drilling down into the specifics of the breed or species, or, and which animals are we just like spider? It's a spider, <laughs> even though there are millions of kinds. I of think spider. to be. I, I think to be fair, it's could the general put like I could name types of dog, I could name types of bird, I couldn't actually name a type of dolphin. I could name a type of shark, but not a dolphin. Mm, yeah, maybe that's where it is. Anyway, it's very yeah. much off track, anyway. off, off, off thing. But yes. uh, I've yeah, <laughs> there we go. That's Dan has said where you can find us. I've I've been Chris Billingham. I've been Dan Dillon. and this review from the Wizarding World has been rewound. Fuck the Wizarding World. Fuck the Wizarding World. It's a stupid name. Oh, this is the public are all just yelling out that it's terrible. I don't know. It's the worst thing. I hate it. Hermione, Hermione says it in the Half-Blood Prince and I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, it's embedded early. Or maybe, no, I don't think, no, actually, I don't know if she says it in the book. It's said in the final film because I rewatched the final film. Because uh, I didn't watch it for the podcast with Jess, so I rewatched it with her, and it uh, it's said oh, by thing. Hermione in that you film. Poor thing.
I know, I know. Yeah. Were you looking at your phone a lot the second time? Uh, I wasn't very well, Dan, so it didn't really... It, did not, it A lot of it washed over me, if I'm honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 